Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the Tech Guy is provided by Cashfly. C A C H E F L Y dot com. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. The show originally aired on the Premier Network Saturday, February 25th, 2017. This is episode 1366. Don't forget, just a couple of days left if you haven't taken our Twit survey. It would be a great help to us if you would. It's quick, just a couple of minutes at twit.tv slash survey. It helps us let advertisers know who's listening, not you specifically, but in general, what kinds of people listen to our shows. Uh, and it's a, a great help to us. We do this once a year. And if you can find the time, I'd appreciate it. Twit.tv slash survey. Do it while you're uh, listening to the show. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage from Quicken Loans. When it comes to the big decision of choosing a mortgage lender, work with one that has your best interest in mind. Use Rocket Mortgage for a transparent, trustworthy home loan process that's completely online at quickenloans.com slash tech guy. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. It's time to talk tech. Yeah, every week we do this, uh, believe it or not. Yep, for the last 24 years, 25 years, something like that. I should find out, actually, <laughs> when I started doing tech talk. It might be my 25th anniversary. It was either 91 or 92. It's at least my 25th anniversary. We started doing this. Nothing but answering questions about technology. Of course, uh, 25 years ago, it was a different thing. We talked a lot about abacuses and uh, StarTac phones. <laughs> I don't know what we were talking about. Windows 3.1 and uh, DOS 5, I think. We've come a long way, baby. I always say, you know, there's a... I think this is probably not true, but there's a, a saying that if you start lifting a baby cow when it's born, and you probably can above your head, and you continue to do that every day, by the time it's a full-grown cow, you should be able to lift the entire cow because you've worked up to that. This is probably not true. But I feel like I've been lifting this baby cow, now a giant bull, and I do mean bull, since 1991. So, if you want to ask me a question, I'll just <laughs> heft that heifer. 8888-ASK-LEO is the uh, number. 888-827-5536. If you want to uh, call from the U.S. or Canada, that's toll-free. If outside that area, though, you can still use Skype out or something like that, and it shouldn't cost you anything. We have a website, techguylabs.com. That's where everything I say will be, so you don't have to write down any links or anything. In fact, the phone number's there. A link to our great chat room is there. Uh, just remember, really, all you have to remember is uh, techguylabs.com techguylabs.com. Uh, we talk about computers. We talk about, uh, well, now, <laughs> since uh, 1991, things have changed a little bit. The Internet appeared. Can you believe that? It's not that old, is it? It's just a baby. Just a baby. Uh, we also talk about smartphones. Those didn't exist till 10 years ago, really, at least in their current slab of glass incarnation. Smart watches, they, those are only a few years old, right? Virtual reality, that's 25, 30 years old. <laughs> everything new is old again, or everything old is anyway. It's uh, augmented reality, that's pretty new. Microsoft uh, announced this week that they are going to defer uh, development of HoloLens. Hol you know about the HoloLens? Right now it's available for $3,500 as a developer's thing. But uh, it, it's still very interesting. It's what we call augmented or mixed reality. Microsoft sells this to developers. It's a, you look, it's a visor. You look like Geordi in Star Trek, you know, like you're wearing some special shades. And inside the visor, this is what's kind of interesting about HoloLens because it doesn't have any wires. Inside the visor is a full Windows 10 PC and all the hardware it needs to project things onto the lenses. So you can still see through the lenses like you're wearing sunglasses, but projected into a small window on the lenses is stuff from the computer. Could be the interface, menus, buttons, things like that. Could be a game. Microsoft showed uh, people playing Minecraft where you look at a table, a real-life table, table in your 
in your room, and but on top of it is a Minecraft castle that you've built. And you can zoom into it and stuff. And it looks like it's on the table until you take off the HoloLens. They've also demonstrated uh, teleconferencing. You're wearing HoloLens. Somebody in another city is wearing HoloLens. They look like they're there with you. You look like they're, you're there with them. That's kind of neat. Anyway, we, you know, Microsoft originally said, you know, sometime this year uh, the next version would come out. They announced this week, and I think it might, might have been kind of misunderstood, that they weren't going to do version 2. That they were going to work hard on version 3, which would be out sometime in 2019, two years from now. And I think some people thought, oh, see, it's a failure, it's not working. I didn't take it that way, and I think Microsoft didn't intend it that way. What they, what they I think, really were saying is... We're not going to waste time with any intermediate product. We're going to go straight to the final product. We're going to work as hard as our little programming fingers can to get HoloLens to its final state in a couple of years. And part of that is because there's competition. We've heard a lot about Apple, you know, maybe doing something like this this year. I don't think so, but, you know. Apple's way behind. I mean, Google already has, you know, Google Cardboard. A little, little bit of cardboard it was small enough and cheap enough. They actually bundled it with the New York Times last year. And you could put it, you know, put it, put it up like a Viewmaster to your eyes and be in a 360-degree movie. You could look around. And they've been doing reporting like that. Google's doing some other interesting things, including an Academy Award-nominated short called Pearl. It'll be up for an Oscar tomorrow that it, you, you can watch on a 2D screen. But you also could put on the lens or put on a, a, a some other a virtual reality helmet. Virtual reality is distinct from augmented reality because you can't see the outside world. You can only see what's projected on the screens in front of you. But this movie, Pearl, is cool. You're in a car, and, and it's a kind of a... You're watching a girl and scenes from her life as she grows up, and it's fantastic with music. The music's carefully designed so that it's... When you turn your head, it comes from a different, you know, it's 360-degree music as well as 360-degree video. So, you know, this is this is already out. Samsung has its Gear VR, and they've sold millions of those. Of course, there's the Oculus Rift and the Vive. So this is already out. So uh, whatever Apple's doing, uh, it better hurry up. It's got some catching up. To, you've got some catching up to do. Microsoft already has put out the HoloLens, but it's not a consumer product by any means, and it probably won't be for a couple of years. The issue there, I think, is battery life and power. You've got to get a lot of power and and really good battery life into this these sunglasses, or, you know, it's not going to be practical. Lots of other companies, including one that everybody's watching carefully, it's raised more than a billion dollars called Magic Leap. And they have, you know, shown imaginary videos of what they hope to do. And it's pretty interesting. Technology is going very quickly in this. So we could, we could talk a little bit about that, too. Self-driving vehicles, too. Google's Waymo, their, uh, their self-driving vehicle initiative, just sued Uber over Otto. <laughs> Uber bought Otto. Otto is a tr self-driving truck that's already been on the roads quite a bit. It delivered 22,000 cans of Bud, I believe, uh, a couple of months ago. Without uh, The driver was just, you know, kind of taking a nap in the cab in the back. <whistles> that scares me a little bit. 18-wheeler ro rolling down at 80 miles an hour on, and a computer's driving it? Yikes. But that's coming, too. Anyway, Google says, you know... And I think this is true. There's such a race. This is kind of analogous to the race in augmented and virtual reality. There's such a race for autonomous vehicles that companies are cutting corners. In this case, they claim Uber and Otto stole technology from Waymo. <laughs> uh, well, how did, when, did, when did baby talk become the thing when you name a company? It's fairly recent. I think Google might have started the trend. Google, Google. And then Yahoo. And it's just gone downhill since then. All the good names are taken. Zero Day said, Otto is blotto. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Let's. I'll, I'll leave the politics out of it. Although, we'll be watching with interest as the FCC slowly strips away privacy protections and net neutrality regulations. Uh, the, I think the goal of the new FCC chairman, Ajit Pai, is to eliminate regulation, basically. 
and what regulation is done. He'd like to have a, he says, a unified body, a uniform regulatory framework, not under the Federal Communications Commission. He thinks the Federal Trade Commission should be in charge of the Internet. And, of course, the big ISPs like Comcast are saying, yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> we, we agree. <laughs> Great idea. Yeah, we can talk about that, too. 8888-ASK-LEO, website techguylabs.com. Heather Haman is there waiting for your call, and she'll pick a few of you. Get the cowlicks flattened out, put a little powder on your nose, and we'll get you on the air right after this. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888-ASK-LEO. I didn't talk about it, but I will later. Maybe I'll do it next hour. Um, because it's kind of a, a techie topic, kind of a high geek topic, but probably you'll be seeing news about a kind of serious security issue with a company called Cloudflare. And, uh, you know, I'll have to, it's going to take some time to explain what it is and whether you need to worry about it. I guess the bottom line is, uh, just in case you've seen stories about it, it's been all the, it's been the big story in, uh in tech news this week, is nothing to fear at this point, but keep an eye out. Cloudflare is a service used by thousands of websites to make it, uh, I guess I'm going to go into this, aren't I? All right. <laughs> Might as well, just quickly, since I brought it up, uh, to make their sites respond more quickly uh, and to avoid being brought down by a distributed denial of service hacker attacks. So, and Cloudflare is the most popular solution. They're really good. Unfortunately, um, there was a bug in some of their software which might have leaked, and this is the scary thing, might have leaked information not about Cloudflare, but about the sites that use Cloudflare, which is pretty much every site you use. I mean, it's a lot of big sites, a lot of them. Not our sites, not Tech Guy Labs, but because uh, I'm not big enough, <laughs> but big sites. And the, the scare is, well, what was what was leaked? Which sites were affected? It doesn't look like it was all the sites that use Cloudflare. In fact, as best I can tell, it's a small number of sites that use Cloudflare. Uh, and it's not clear what information was leaked. But this has been a problem since September. It was only discovered a week ago today by a, a security researcher at Google, Tavis Ormady, who's uh, really the king of all this stuff. Um, Google and Cloudflare did not release information about it till Friday or Thursday because they wanted to clear the Google search caches of any possible leaked information. You know, the search engines kind of cache, they store that stuff, and they didn't want anybody to get to it. So they were very careful not to say anything. They fixed the bug, they cleared the caches, and it's their belief that, you know, it, there's nobody who can take advantage of this retroactively. However, it's unknown whether somebody did discover it earlier and took advantage of it earlier. The thing to watch for is, you know, when you log into your sites, if they suggest you do a password reset, you should. But that's always true. Sites frequently, uh, we hear about all these uh, breaches all the time, these data breaches. And if a site ever says change your password, you should. Uh, one thing that will help, and you should be doing this anyway, is turning on what we call two-factor authentication. I know it's a pain in the behind, but it really does make you a lot safer. That is, you enter a password and then you either get texted a number or you have to use a special program or a card to get a second number, beside, a second piece of information besides your password. It's a second factor because it's not just something in your head, something you know, which is your password. It's something you have, your phone or a special dongle or key card. Um, if you have that turned on, and you should for certainly for, for any sites that allow it, including Facebook and Twitter and Google. Uh, if you don't have that turned on, turn it on now. And if you want to be really proactive, you got a little time on the weekend, you might want to change uh, passwords on a few of your sites. Um, this is one of the reasons it's great to use a password manager like LastPass or 1Password uh, because they'll, uh, they'll do this for you automatically. They, they will run a security check, use the watchtower feature of 1Password, they will let you know what what sites passwords need to be changed. So this is a this is a ongoing story. We don't yet know how bad it is. It looks pretty bad. Cloudflare and Google did exactly the right thing. 
you can't even really blame uh, Cloudflare. It wasn't, a, it wasn't their bug. It was a bug in some software, they, uh, the library they used. Nevertheless, it's something fairly serious for everybody. And I'll keep, keep you posted on this. A lot of misreporting going on, too, in, uh, in the mainstream press. So keep your, keep your ear here, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you the real deal. Now, let's say hello to the fabulous Heather Homan, HH. -H. We, uh, shwoo, thank you, Uncle Leo. Shwoo. Because <laughs> I'm worried about my OK Cupid conversation. OK Cupid Luckily, was one I'm of them. Really nice to everyone. OK I'm Cupid was sure. one of them. It wouldn't necessarily be your conversations, although it could be. See, this is the problem. It could be a variety of things, including your passwords. Um, but a, a site like OK Cupid probably is well secured. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, if what I would do is, if there's something like OK Cupid that you're worried about. Go log in and see if they say to change the password. And 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 then keep an eye on over the next week or so, because they're still trying to figure this out, too. I like to practice safe computing. Yes. <laughs> it's getting harder and harder, though, isn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, you've been talking to people on the phone, and, and, uh, and you know, you are, you are in the front lines talking to people about the things they care the most about. It's kind of, it's kind of like... You're, you're having your own kind of congressional constituent assemblies. <laughs> and they come and they yell at you and they say, Windows, what's going on? And that kind of thing. Who should it's I true. Who should I talk to first? <laughs> Joe in Wikiwachi, Florida. I'm Poor glad, Joe. I had to ask him how to spell it. I'm glad it. you said and that. It's just like it sounds. <laughs> Wikiwachi. Sure it is. <laughs> Thank you, Heather. Yeah, Wikiwachi. That's where we have all the mermaids. Wikiwachi. Yeah. All right. That's where mermaids come from. Nice. Yeah, we're just about 60 miles north of Tampa. Nice. What can I do for you? Uh, I do a lot of photo shoots, and I'm trying to do something a little bit different where I'm using green screen technology. Fun. Okay, Are, but do you shoot well, mermaids? Yeah. Nice. And they, they come out really good. Uh, the whole idea is... I know you have post-production where you can do your shots and then edit and have your backgrounds and everything put into it then. What I want to do, because when I do uh, a lot of school photo shoots, uh, like eighth grade dances. And oh, things, yeah, that's you where get... you want a backdrop, right? Right. Yeah. And you have a couple hundred kids. you got to just go through really quick. Yeah. What I need, and I've seen a couple companies have them, but I haven't been able to get what I really need totally, is where when they sit behind a green screen, you have on your computer the background, and they can actually see it on the monitor. Yeah. You shoot them, and you print it, and it's already there. There's yeah. nothing else to do afterwards. Yeah. Uh, there's a couple companies, like I said, that I've seen it with, but one I've been trying to get in touch with for about two months, and every time you go to their site, it just says we're unavailable at this time. Do you use, uh, uh, do you, when you shoot, do you tether? Do you know uh, what I mean? Do you tether to a laptop? Well, that's right the, now, that's the is just shooting with a regular backdrop. Right. So this is the first step. A lot of you'll see this a lot of model shoots and advertising shoots. The when you take a picture, it goes and it goes right to a screen uh, where it you know in Lightroom or in some other program where 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 the client can see it. Right. And uh, that's called tethering, and that you can do it wirelessly. Most people want to because they'd like to be moving around. But in your case, wired would probably be all right too. That's the first step. You need to have. Uh, a tether to software on the screen because the software is what's going to do the keying. That is, replace the green with, you know, under the sea. So uh, that's step one is get tethering. And, you know, that means you're going to add something to your camera, usually a little radio transmitter, and to your laptop. Software, you need the software that will do that, like Lightroom. And we're, we have to take a break, unfortunately. But when we come back, I'll talk a little bit about what software to do the keying with. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Thank you. So as they say, so there is that list. People in the chat room are saying, well, what about this list on GitHub? Um, we're talking about the Cloudflare issue. That list is a list of sites using Cloudflare. That's not enough. That's not what you need. In fact, they even say on this list, you know, disclaimer, this list contains all domains that use Cloudflare, not just the Cloudflare proxy. So the, the bug only hit sites that used not just the Cloudflare proxy, but two other technologies. They had to use all three for it to be a problem. So it is a much smaller... I don't like this list because 
it scares you because this is too many people. It's every Cloudflare customer. They are not all affected. <sighs> so this is one of the reasons I really want to talk about uh, this because if, if people see this list, it's terrifying. And nobody reads the disclaimer. So uh, if you read the um, Cloudflare has been so Cloudflare has been very specific, um, but some say that they haven't been forthcoming. They're trying to cover it up. I just I don't believe that that's the case. Um. So anyway, to go back, so you're still on the uh, on the on the call, Joe. I'm not. I didn't hang up on you. I just had to take a break because of the network. Uh, okay. So so you would be, you know, you have the student, you have them in front of a green screen, and you can get, you know, nice B and H cells, green screens you, that you are portable that stretch out because you don't want any wrinkles, and you probably have to have a couple of lights just for the green screen because it has to be perfectly flatly lit. And, oh, yeah. And you don't want the student's shadow cast on the green screen. So they need dedicated light. The screen needs dedicated lights. Right. They have to be uh, like three, four feet in yeah. front of it so you don't get the shadows. Exactly. Or any flares. Exactly. There's lights for the students, but there's also lights for the screen. And the screen can't have any wrinkles. But if it's, but so what you're get, making basically is a perfect green background. And then uh, there are lots of programs. I What we need, and I'm not sure off the top of my head, but I'm sure somebody listening will help me. Um, there are lots of programs, I'm sure, that both tether and key, because that's what you need. You need tethering and keying, because what you want is you take the picture, it goes through the tether, wireless or not, into the computer. The computer then displays it. This is what they do in model shoots, and uh, and, and, and lot. you see it all the time in ad shoots, because if you're doing an ad shoot, the client wants to see the picture. It's actually a bad trend, in my opinion, but anyway, the client wants to see the picture. So the, so the clients, the ad director's standing there staring at every shot, and then we'll move that, move this. And uh, and so what you need is, and often Lightroom is used for that, but there are other programs you can use to tether. What we need is one that will key. I don't think Lightroom does keying. Capture One Pro, Yashamaru says. Yashamaru, does that do keying? Capture One Pro. It's a tethering program, I know. And so you just need one that does keying. And then what you'll, you'll do is you'll set up the key ahead of time without anybody in the picture. And then as they get in the picture, they'll actually see, as you, at each time you shoot it, They'll have it. They'll see. Oh, there I am under the sea. Yeah, sort of like when you have uh, the fake magazine. Yeah. Uh, pictures. Yeah, that's how they're doing it too. Is like a whole package that would have everything that I need, uh, turnkey ready to go. Well, B and H definitely sells um, the the green screen kits. You know, um, Capture One is really kind of a very is probably the most popular tethering program. Let me see if it does keying. Yeah, Yashimaro, does it uh, does it do keying? Do you know? Yeah, actually, B and H. I was looking at. Uh, they sell booths that yeah. the person sits. They in. have the whole thing. Right. Yeah. But yeah, I got I got to run. We got to we got to take them out of the break. I'll probably I'm going to go to Scott Wilkinson because it's his time. But I'll I'll just recap here for you. Talked a little more with Joe during the break. Um, he was looking for a, he's a, uh, so you I love this. You're doing high school, uh, photography, right? Say you're at the prom and the theme is under the sea. And what he wants is as each kid comes up, you know, the, with their date, they stand in front of a green screen and on the computer screen, he turns it around and shows them they're there under the sea. And, and look, there's the lobster and Ariel, the mermaid. And they're just, you know, in the, in the picture. And that's called keying, where, and you do it generally with a solid screen behind you. Blue or green is very common. You want It's a little tricky because if the girl or the guy are wearing green, <laughs> that tends to disappear. <laughs> and so if he's wearing a green necktie, he's going to have under the sea an under the sea necktie. may not be bad. Uh, they use blue or green because uh, they're not colors that appear in human flesh usually, unless you're kind of queasy. And uh, so they can be keyed out uh, generally fairly uh, easily. And then uh, somebody in the chat room um, who is a photographer, uh, Mashamaru, says, I use, and a lot of photographers use this, uh, Capture One Pro for tethering. And the only key would be if this does keying. 
And then Joe wanted to know, well, is there an all-in-one uh, kit for this? And I said, I think, I think yes, many many photography supplies stores uh, sell it. I'm pre I've seen them on B and H Photo uh, for sure. So there, yes, this is not an uncut. What you want to do, you you, you see at amusement parks everywhere, right? And uh, you know, at at uh, at uh, tourist locations, picture of you, you know, with the seals or patting the lion or whatever. Scott Wilkinson is here, our home theater guru. Sorry to eat into your time, Scott. That's quite all right. Did you have a nice yeah. vacation? Oh, mostly, yes. We, you went uh, to Esalen, we where it was flooding, well, probably. We, we, were, we wanted to go to Esalen. Didn't we the tried bridge to go get to washed Esalen. out? The bridge got washed out. We were driving there, and we looked at Google Maps and said, wow, the road looks weird. Called Esalen. They said, turn around. Yeah. The bridge is out. There was a crack in the bridge. They're going to have yeah. to replace it. It's going to take a year. Well, that'll make <laughs> Esalen even more special. Only people with helicopters will be able to Exactly. <laughs> the only way in and out of Big Sur right now is by helicopter. Wow. Wow. <laughs> oh, I'm so, so we, sorry, because that is a wonderful spot. It really One is. One of the most beautiful yeah. places in the world. Yep. Yep, it is. But, you know, people who live there, and there are locals, uh, but they pay the price sometimes. Yeah. Just like people who live in other beautiful but sometimes occasionally dangerous places. Right. And uh, now they're paying the price of we're trapped here, and we when are we, how are we going to get supplies in by helicopter? <laughs> yeah, wow. Yeah, that so happens. We, that happens whenever there's. Uh, it's not unusual. I can remember it happening in the past from heavy rain. Well, yeah, but we haven't had heavy rain for I like know six seven years. years. Yeah, we've been in the drought. <laughs> Welcome to the wonderful wilds of nature. Now in, you're in. not here to talk rain. No, I'm not. I'm here to talk technology, and in fact, specifically video and audio technology. And I got a couple questions from uh, listeners. Okay, fire away. Uh, Lance uh, Pel uh, Pelissier is saying, with uh, USB-C becoming more common on things like cell phones, MP3 players, laptops, and so on, in the future, may we see video over USB become the norm? And I think the answer is no. Uh, for one thing... Uh, USB, even the fastest USB, I believe is on the order of, three, USB 3.1 is on the order of 10 gigabits per second. Uh, uh, HDMI uh, 2.0 is 18 gigabits per second. And HDMI 2.1, the new standard, which will be coming out later this year, is up to 48 gigabits per second. So that's going to be plenty to carry 4K, a uh, high dynamic range, uh, lots of extra metadata and, and all sorts of things that uh, USB would not be able to carry at 10 gigabits per second. So a lot of people are asking, you know, well, are we ever going to see a replacement for HDMI? HDMI is the, the one cable connection between devices now that is, uh, you know, ubiquitous among audio, video, home theater type stuff. Uh, and people ask, well, what about USB? What about uh, MHL, um, this um, sort of portable thing, which is kind of like, like HDMI. It's very similar. Or, or DisplayPort. And I say, even if they have the bandwidth, they have to overcome an incredible amount of inertia. They're, every product has an HDMI port on it. Only a few have DisplayPort. More in the computer world, than in the home theater world. And I don't think DisplayPort or any other type of connection is really going to supplant HDMI because it's already so entrenched in, in the market, in the, in the field. So anyway, that's what I think about that. Good. Uh, uh, Stanford Brown asked... Uh, By the way... He, do, yes? Do, does anybody have to worry about that, or should you just go to the store and buy the TV and buy the cable and leave it at that? I mean, you absolutely, have to, you don't have to really. You don't have to worry about. You know, no, excuse you me, but what spec is this? Do you have to? <laughs> well, <clears throat> there are a couple of reasons to to be a little bit on to be informed a little bit. Um, okay. The main one is with high dynamic range or HDR. There's a, a, a there's a type of HDR very common called HDR10, and it has metadata in it that, that explains or describes how the content was created. And if that metadata does not survive going through, say, an audio-video receiver, 
then it won't get to the TV and the TV won't display it properly. So the audio video receiver or any device that you pass the signal through has to be able to pass that metadata. And that requires HDMI 2.0A. Hmm. Um, so HDMI does not want us talking about uh, version numbers. As you just said, Why do I even really need to think about this? Yeah. And they they don't want you to. No, they would rather... Not. They would rather the manufacturer say, our device will pass HDR10 metadata. Whoa, that's uh, good. That's so much clearer. <laughs> so much clearer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or or whatever the, the, the particular feature is, they want the manufacturers to say exactly what their HDMI feature list is. But manufacturers aren't going to do that. They're just not going to, especially not on the outside of the box or in their promotional materials when you're shopping. <sighs> That's why, I, and that this is the one argument for uh, a standard like uh, mm. D Dolby THX or, or UH, well, what, is, what is it, the UHD Premium. If UHD you, Premium, If you yeah. define a standard mm -hmm. and and uh, everybody you know agrees that that standard should include HDR10 compatibility, for instance. Right, right. Then all a consumer has to look for, and this is what we're recommending right now if you buy a, uh, buy a device, is UHD Premium, right? Well, yes, that UHD premium is really, o really only mostly applies to to displays, TVs. Uh, okay, so it won't it, help you if you're choosing a Blu-ray player, or sadly not. Uh. So that's <laughs> but that's why you need that bad, you know, that badge because then you'll know. You okay, this yes. is going to be compatible with everything I want. Yep. It yep. is true. It is the case if you're buying a TV, look if you, and you want 4K and and and, and a, HDR. HDR that you should choose UHD premium, right? That would be that would be an assurance that it's doing what what you want it to do but like, there's nothing you're... there's nothing like that for choosing a, a uhd blu-ray player mm, i don't think they have ultra hd premium certification for <laughs> blu-ray players dolby just announced a logo program to make sure that you know if a device will pass dolby vision but that HD. doesn't tell you hdr 10 because they're competitors no it doesn't Yep, that's right. Well, not competitors, but coexistence, shall we say. <laughs> oh, they're competitors. All right. Scott Wilkinson, you'll find his uh, work on the uh, web at uh, uh, the uh, ABS forums, absforum.com. And also, he is at the Home Theater Geek Podcast, twit.tv slash HTG. And he helps us in this minefield of buying new audiovisual technology. And it is, a, yep. you can see, it's a minefield at this it point. It is, I'm afraid so. Yeah. Thank you, Scott. We'll talk again next week. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. More to come right after this. It just, it, <laughs> the more you talk about this, the more confusing it becomes. So I know. frustrating. See, I, I, know. I, I apologize for opening the Pandora's box, but I, I feel like we can't just say, you know, HDMI, you need 1.6A. And, right. You know, I mean. Right, right, right. It's, it's very, HDMI is a difficult subject. Because of that, you know, you've, you've got these numbers, which mean something. But the problem is the HDMI 2 point, any, any HDMI version number has a list of features that it supports. That does not mean that anybody who implements that version of oh, HDMI right. will implement all those features. Oh, they can choose. Sucks. They can say, I want to implement features 1, 3, 4, and 5, so and not, you know. What is the solution? Uh, uh, well... I think you're right. Some sort of standardization of what does this logo Some mean? Badging. Sort of thing. It's a badging kind of a thing. Yeah. That would be good. Yeah. I think that would be good. I think Ultra HD Premium has the right idea, uh, but it only applies to a certain segment. Right. Uh, the Dolby logo program is the right idea, but it only applies to a certain feature. Yeah. Uh, I would love to see a logo program that really defines everything. This new HDMI 2.1 coming out, 48 uh, gigabits per second, uh, is tremendous. But if you implement 2.1, you don't have to go that fast. <laughs> what? Yeah. Are you kidding so, me? So, wow, that's really... Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's a real mess. It's a mess. It really is. And I, I don't have a final answer to it, uh, but... I just try to keep reporting. and Well, I think the final answer is to buy recommended hardware. I like go to ABS Forum and, and, exactly. and see what their viewers say and then buy the yep. recommended hardware yep. for a lot of reasons. Yep. Somebody I wanted agree. to know, I got an LG B6, much like mine, same as yep. mine, uh, and it's HDR10 and Dolby Vision. Uh, Correct. So that's good. That's very good. He wants that's to know, is there anything else? Is it is Are there now going to be new standards it's incompatible with? No. 
There's no. not going to be any new state. Well, in there's a that sense, there's that IMAX one, right? Isn't well, there an IMAX HDR? No, it's a tech. It's called Technicolor. Technicolor. Okay. And HLG. There are now four types of high dynamic range, and the 2017 LG OLEDs implement all four, or will with far firmware updates. Ah, uh, so a firmware update would be okay. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. But okay. you're not going to get a firmware update to HDMI 2.1 because it's a fast, that's it a requires hardware. new hardware. Yeah. yeah, that's a hardware thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, I can't um, but you can get a firmware update in many cases. And in the case of the 2017 LG OLEDs, uh, they will get a firmware update to do to do HLG, which is more going to be more common with broadcast, uh, and Technicolor uh, HDR, which we haven't seen any examples of in the field yet. I'm looking forward to seeing it to see how it compares. At the moment, I prefer Dolby Vision. I, I think it just works better. And so you don't get the choice though, because whatever the movie is, whatever the movie's in, encoded in, yeah, exactly, exactly. We are promised there are no Ultra HD Blu-ray discs currently available that are encoded with Dolby Vision HDR. It's all HDR10, uh, but we are promised from Warner, I think Universal and Lionsgate uh, to see discs with Dolby Vision encoding this year. And Dolby Vision HDR is already available uh, by streaming. Uh, so, you know, it. I still think it's a, it's a better HDR system, primarily because it uses what's called dynamic metadata. Can you stick uh, around for the top of the hour? Yeah, sure can. All right. So, uh, Puntarab wants to confirm B6 owners will be able to update to the new standard... That I'm not sure, firmware. but I'm going to visit. Uh, I'm going to visit LG next week, and I will ask. Good. All right. Thank you, Scott. Now, if everybody will follow along, and shake it up, baby, twist and shout. Come on, come on, baby. Now, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. We can work it on out. Eighty-eight, eighty-eight. Ask Leo the phone number. And we'll go back to the phones. Neil's on the line from Phoenix. Hi, Neil. How you doing, Leo? Pleasure oh. to take my call. I'm wonderful. Thank you for you. calling. Listen, I listened to last week's show, actually both of them, and at that time I took the advice and I purchased a Harmony Hub because I learned then that I could also use my Amazon Echo with it. Yeah. And I went and... Yeah. And it, I've got it set up. It's a little tricky, but once I got it going, it seems to work. But maybe yeah. I'm just ultimately lazy because, <laughs> well, what I mean to say is I, I, I'm a cable cutter, so a cord cutter, excuse me. So I have an Apple TV and a Fire Stick, uh, but no cable box. Um, got it all working together, except I noticed that once I've connected to the Apple TV, I can't then go into the Apple TV menu and say, start Netflix or start uh, Twitter, whatever whatever app I want it to run. Am I just being too lazy and asking too much of this, or am I missing a step here in this programming process? So first of all, you have the most recent Apple TV? Yeah, Apple TV 4. Okay, yeah, because uh, it was not compatible with the earlier ones. I'm looking at the Harmony Hub setup. What you want, and so just to explain, and I, I bought one too uh, after uh, one of our uh, chat room regulars, Dr. Mom, said how great it was. And you can do things like, say, watch Netflix uh, to your Amazon Echo. You can, of course, do it on your app too. They have an app that works on uh, tablets and phones. And But you can also do activities, and this is what you want to do. You What you would like to do is tell the Echo, uh, I want to watch uh, you know, Netflix on the Apple TV. And the Echo would then tell the Harmony Hub, okay, turn on the TV, whatever, turn on whatever's needed. Make sure the Apple TV's woke. Make sure the receiver is set to, uh, you know, input four. Make sure the TV is set to input one, all of that. And then, and this is the last step and the step you're not getting, uh, tell the Apple TV to go to Netflix. Or tell the Apple TV to launch uh, Victoria on Netflix or The Crown on Netflix. 
or whatever exactly. But that's why I have to pick the app first, before, and, but it doesn't do that. So once I've gotten it to launch Apple TV, I've got the Apple TV menu. And now I've got to grab the remote, which is, the, which is my iPhone or whatever. And yeah, isn't that frustrating? Go. Yeah. This is, yeah, and I'm looking, and I, it's not clear whether it should be able to do more than that. It, it should be able to load at least apps. My, my suspicion is that Apple doesn't give it access past that. Um, have you, uh, have you, and I, are you pairing the, uh, the Harmony app with the Apple TV? Are you telling it? Well, I did. The setup was what it said, which was to let it discover, you know, you launch the setup for the Harmony hub and then it takes you through setup, it joins your Wi-Fi, and then it searches for all of your equipment. Um, and it, and once it, and then it found the it found the Apple TV. It found the Fire Stick. Yeah, and I, I mean, I'm looking at it. And it says you can with the Harmony app uh, control the Apple TV as if you have an Apple remote, but it's through the Harmony exactly. app. I'm right, but I'm, you're still telling you still have to navigate it. You still have to navigate it. My to. guess that's right. a limitation of the Apple TV um, that Apple doesn't have a some sort of interface that the Harmony can 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 hook into. Um, the only device, this is what uh, Miller Tech in our chat room is saying, the only device that allows you to launch apps or channels with the Harmony Hub is the Roku. Other devices, and it really is Apple that's saying no. Other devices don't have a facility that the Harmony can control it with. This has always been my problem with uh, universal remotes, is, 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 and I've always struggled with them a little bit, because they don't do exact. That's what you want, right? You say, "Hey, I don't care where it is. I just want to watch The Crown, please." And it should know, and it should say, "Oh yeah, The Crown's on Netflix, and you like to watch Netflix and then Apple TV, so let's fix that all up and go into The Crown." But I think right. it doesn't. <laughs> I think only the Roku can do all of that. I'm not an expert. I have to continue to to, to play with it myself. So I'm deferring to the chat room. I do have one of them, um, and. You know, it's a it's a main reason I got it, and the and the main value of it is that you know my uh, significant other and family members don't have to figure out which of the which of the five remotes to access in which order to get the thing on. All they have to do is say, "Watch Netflix" to the Echo, and at least it gets them that far, right? Right. And, and at that point, they they can figure out, "Oh, well, now I pick up the Apple remote and do the rest." Um. I, I think it may be that it doesn't do that final step, which would be so nice. And it, and if that's the case, it's 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 Apple. It's Apple not. And this is very Apple. They're so oh, they're so Apple. That's what they do. They don't want you to use other stuff. They want you to use their stuff. So I will. I'll tell you what. It's a very good question. I don't know the definitive answer. My it wouldn't surprise me if Apple doesn't give them access. Um. So Miller Tech is saying you can't you can't do that except with the Roku. Um, you can only choose apps. You can only get that far. You can't get any farther. So let me. But I'll tell you what. We'll keep listen. Keep listening. Okay. We'll we'll continue to look for an answer. Check the website at techguylabs.com. People can add comments there. So if they hear the show after the fact, they go, Oh yeah, I know how to do that. And I'm gonna. I haven't spent as much time as I'd like to. I'm going to play with that a little bit um, tonight and come back. We'll come back on the next show, and I'll, I'll see what I can get, how far I can get with the Harmony Hub. I was just happy that I could say, watch Netflix, <laughs> and Netflix would come on. That, that at least gets the TV on, gets the receiver set the right place. That is such a huge step forward for everybody else in the in the family. I can do it. But, you know, that's how it is, isn't it? There's one person. I wrote a manual. I had to write a 10-page manual for how to use our TV set. <laughs> and, it's, and nobody's going to go through that. First, okay, first, turn on the TV and select input one, HDMI one. Okay, very important. Not HDMI two, very important. Like HDMI one. Then you need to turn on the TV. And then you need to turn on the AV receiver. These now no, already we're at three different remotes. And in the AV receiver, you need to make sure you go to cable sat. Okay, and once you're on cable sat, now you can pick up the Roku remote and you get it's yeah. This unfortunately, even a, a universal remote like the Harmony Hub, as good as it is, doesn't doesn't get you to the, that last place which you want it to be, which is I just want to watch 
The Crown. I just want to watch Rick and Morty. Can you please? Let me just ask, because Scott Wilkinson's still around. Scott, do you use any uh, universal remotes? Do you have any? I uh, use the Harmony. Yeah. Harmony Are you able to do what this guy wants to do? Uh, you know, I was I was focused on answering some questions. Oh, sorry. I didn't really spend <laughs> I, I wasn't teacher. I, I wasn't. Be <laughs> <laughs> no, you. No, look, you're working overtime as it is. I can't complain. Right. I just thought since you're there, I'll I'll, I'll pull you in. Sure, um, sure. You know, I've not yet used a you know a a, a voice activated. That's pretty cool. Thing. I, I think I need to really start looking at the that holy again. grail of that. Would be able to say. Would literally be able to say, uh, uh, "Hey, Echo." watch archer and it would know from there everything it needed to do mm -hmm. to get the t and because our tv setups especially if you listen to scott and you've got all those fancy things like mm -hmm. i did are mm -hmm. way too complicated well it, it is more complicated than it needs to be and yes. i think these uh, voice activated systems they might be the are, solution yep. might, or they're certainly working towards that towards Thank solving you, scott. that problem i'm glad you're still here to help yeah. me <laughs> More of your calls coming up. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hang in there. We'll be right back. Okay. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's the Wilker Man. Oh. Y all yours, Scott. I get 500 seconds. Thank you yes, so sir. very much. Um, yeah, I don't. I must admit, I have not tried the those voice activated things yet, but I think I need to get a an Echo and. Uh, Is the har yeah the Harmony Hub works with the Echo? That's the idea. Yeah, yeah, it does. Doctor Mom's been a been a big proponent of that, and I I have not yet taken the time to investigate it myself, so I need to do that. I think Mike Heiss is in the chat room. I think he's done it, uh, haven't you, Mike? Um, oh, and Cavo, this thing Cavo Cooper Cooper mentioned this is another thing that uh, might be a good integrator or aggregator. Uh, one thing that sort of you say, I want to watch this, and it goes out and finds where it is, on what device, on what streaming platform, or what broadcast channel, or what, or maybe on your even on your DVR. Uh, uh, I think Colleen at, at Twit turned me on to this at first. Uh, so I need to look into that, too, because that's pretty cool. I learned about that just as I was going on vacation, so I didn't have a chance to really uh, spend much time looking at it. But uh, I, it does look pretty interesting what little time I did spend on it. C-A-A-V-O. Uh, I'm going to have to check that out. Uh, Jim Four is asking, uh, do you like the Yamaha Receiver RX481? I don't know that one in particular, but I do know that I like Yamaha receivers generally very much. Uh, they... In fact, my very first stereo receiver ever was a Yamaha, and uh, it's got a it had a beautiful sound. I don't have it anymore, but uh, that was <laughs> decades ago. Anyway, uh, Yamaha receivers are generally really excellent, so I would not hesitate recommending a Yamaha receiver at all. So let's see what else. Uh, Mike Kais, in fact, in the chat room was talking about uh, the Sony UHD Blu-ray players. There are two announced, but not out yet. And uh, will they do HDR10 and Dolby Vision? Sony's being very cagey about that. They're not saying. And I've asked them specifically. Well, we, we, we're not revealing that yet. I guess when the player comes out, we'll know. The good news is the um, uh, Oppo UDP203 the LG UP970 and the Philips BDP7502 all do HDR10 and Dolby Vision, and they have two HDMI outputs. Here's another complication for you with regard to HDMI and what will it do. Uh, if you have one, ideally, you should have one HDMI connection from your player to your AV receiver, and then another one from your AV receiver to your TV. The problem is, will the AV receiver pass all the data that's coming from the player through its circuits and on to the TV? And the answer, as I just discovered, is probably not, especially when it comes to Dolby Vision. Um, even though Dolby Vision is technically a little easier to deal with from a data point of view than HDR10, 
because it embeds the metadata within the video stream rather than having it ride separately in a different layer. Uh, but even with that advantage, the, the AV receiver or, or sound bar, anything you need to pass an HDMI signal through, uh, if it's not aware of the sort of special circumstances of Dolby Vision, it may very well not pass through which is why Dolby is coming up with a logo program that says, if you can see this logo, it'll pass Dolby Vision through the AV receiver or whatever. So um, the answer is, to, if you don't have an AV receiver that has that, and most don't right now, the answer is to have two HDMI outputs from the uh, player. One carrying the video is connected directly to the display. And that way, there's no device for it to pass through and possibly get corrupted. The other one carries only the audio data, typically, to the AVR. And the AVR deals with the audio, whether it's Dolby Digital or DTS or Dolby Atmos or DTSX or whatever. Uh, the, the second HDMI output from the player goes to the, to the AVR. What I'd rather see is one connection, as I said, that goes goes from the player to the AVR and then from the AVR to the display. Uh, and that'll happen next year or later this year. It's always something, isn't it? Jeez. Um, anyway, so that's the answer to that question. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Andrew MC. Yeah, I, I do know model numbers pretty well. All right, David Bind, I just won the lottery. What do I what do you recommend I buy now that money is no option, no obstacle? <laughs> I would definitely say um, go to Sony and uh, buy a Cletus. This is meant to be a commercial display system. It's modular. You can build any size screen you want. Uh, it uses what's called micro LED, which is tiny, microscopic little LEDs, red, green, and blue, uh, shining directly. Uh, the example we saw, the demo we saw at CES was just mind-blowing, just mind-blowing. Uh, so <laughs> it's tremendously expensive, but you said money, no object. Uh, otherwise, I might suggest the... 77 inch w7 oled from lg uh we don't have a price on that yet but their 77 inch 2016 model the g6 uh, is twenty thousand bucks so we can imagine the w7 will be at least that much probably more uh but uh hey money's no object and then get uh, uh jbl m2 speakers uh for front for at least front, right, and left, a uh, center. If you uh, have a, if you want to do a projector, and money is no object, uh, get uh, I'd say probably the the either the JVC uh, RS forty five hundred laser illuminated uh, projector. That's thirty five grand, four K, or the Sony uh, VPL five thousand. Uh, that's fifty thousand dollars. And then get a good uh, acoustically transparent screen. That'll be a few thousand bucks. Uh, could be up to 20 if you get a director's choice from Stewart Film Screen, which is a great frame with four-way masking, all beautiful. But hey, money's no object, right? Uh, and then get three M2 speakers. Put, those be put them behind the screen. And then uh, LSR 708s for the surrounds and maybe 705s for the, for the Atmos. Uh, get a Trinov... Um, Altitude 32 processor, uh, that's uh, a good 15 grand. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to spend all your money here for you, but uh, it's easy to do in, in AV. That's for darn sure. A Andrew MC, would I go for a projector or a flat panel? It depends on how good my light control is. If my light control in my room is really good, which it is, I would probably go for a projector, which I do. Um, flat really? panel is... Yeah. You, you prefer, just because of the bigger screen? Yeah, exactly. Although, I will say this, HDR, high, di high dynamic range, is not nearly as well defined or established. Yeah, I like projectors. direct view. I really do. Yeah, many people do. Yeah, I just sit close. There you go. It makes it big. Thank you, Scott. My pleasure. Have a great week. Sorry about Esalen. Yeah. 
Me too. Uh, but we stayed in Cambria. It was lovely. Oh, that's beautiful. Good. Yeah. All right. Take care. All right. Thanks. Well, hey, hey, hey. How are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. It's time to talk computers and the internet and home theater and digital photography and smartphones. You know, all that stuff with a chip in it. 8888-ASK-LEO is the phone number. 888-827-5536. Toll free from uh, anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. Outside that area, you can still use a voice over the internet like Skype. Skype out and uh, call us directly. 888-827-5536. That's what uh, Kenny did in uh, Springfield, Missouri. Hello, Kenny. Hello, how are you doing? I'm well. How are you? I'm doing great. Doing great. Welcome. What can I do for you today? Uh, yes, I'm looking for a laptop uh, that has uh, great speakers, uh, yeah, hmm. a good battery, uh, maybe an RJ45 connection. What's and, that for? Um, you know, just a... For Ethernet, you mean? All around laptop. Internet? Oh, yes, RJ45. Yeah, yes. yeah, okay. Uh, you know, the gigabit Ethernet or... Yeah, yeah. Higher. So this, the toughest one is speakers because uh, the laptop enclosure is fairly small. And, you know, there's a direct correlation between the quality of the speakers, the loudness of the speakers, and the size of the speakers. So small laptop speakers are never going to sound as good as even, you know, small desktop computer speakers. In fact, if you look at your computer like speakers, they're so big. If you put like them in the laptop, the the, yeah, yeah. Well, it's not the TVs. They do it because they could put better speakers in TVs. They just figure, well, you're going to add your own nowadays. Um, so let me think what would be a good laptop for you. What are you going to do with it? Uh, maybe play games and do some graphics. You know, just I just want to, you know. If you're know. willing, if you're willing yeah, to go a with a bit, yeah, okay, that's what I thought. If you're willing to go with a what we call a desktop replacement laptop, a bigger laptop, bigger, heavier laptop, then you can get decent speakers in it, and it can be a very good gaming system. But it, but what you suffer from is it's heavy. <laughs> it's going to be eight or nine pounds or seven pounds at least. It, it It's also uh, battery life will be not so great. You might get an hour or two. So it's really designed to replace a desktop but be a little bit more portable. Is that the kind of thing you're looking for? Okay, maybe, maybe lighter and sacrifice the... <laughs> killer speakers okay and some okay speakers <laughs> there are you know uh, the reason i asked there are some very good laptops from companies like alienware for gaming they're specifically designed for gaming i mean they have some laptops that go crazy they have one where the screen unfolds and you have three screens that's not what you want <laughs> obviously i think it's ten thousand no, i'm just like yeah that's crazy like, but alienware's yeah. laptops uh, are designed for gaming. They have high-end processors. One of the things about gaming on a laptop is most laptops do not have... Um, they'll have mobile video cards, GPUs. They won't have the full desktop GPUs. Uh, only laptops designed for gaming will have the high-power GPUs. I would look at Alienware. They go from 13 to 15 to 17-inch screens. Uh, all of them can use the fastest Intel processors out there. Uh, all of them uh, offer full desktop uh, NVIDIA cards. So uh, you can go at, with a 1060, 70, or 80, and those are going to give you much better gaming. And because they are gaming systems, they're going to have pretty good speakers. I think this is probably along the lines of what you're looking for. Okay, so Dell's Alienware. Yeah, yeah, they're from Dell. That's right. They acquired Alienware. There's also the Razer, R A Z E R. They make. They started by making gaming mice and keyboards, and they now make really excellent gaming laptops. Uh, and they also have uh, Nvidia, you know, desktop Nvidia cards in there. The Razer Blade, which a lot of people like, is a is a smaller gaming laptop because a lot of these tend to be, you know. Huge. The only reason they're laptops is so you can take them to land parties or something. But the new Razer Blade, which is aptly named, can be very thin, very light, and yet have all of that power. Does that have good battery life as well? Yeah, much better battery life too. Yeah. Oh, I wonder. But you're talking, D you're talking things like desktop RAM, DDR4. You're talking, uh, you know, and desktop cards. All of those things will eat up memory faster than. You, see, you can't, you know, it's one of those things where it's trade-offs. If if you want better battery life, fine, but you're going to have slower RAM, you're going to have less RAM, you're going to have, uh, you know, des that mobile class processors and mobile class video cards because everything else eats, you know, juice. 
So it's kind of a trade-off. You have to decide what kind of gaming, for instance. Oh, just uh, your you know regular World of Warcraft. Or, That's not too uh, demanding. So if you're doing a really demanding game, if you were doing Call of Duty or Crisis or something like that, you know, you'd one of these razors would be a good choice. Probably the Alienware would be even better. Um, I think for World of Warcraft, a razor blade would be pretty good. I'm not sure what the battery life that they claim is, but I could just tell you when you see something like a GTX 1060 and DDR4 RAM, uh, you're you're seeing something that's not going to have eight hours of battery life. You know. Uh, okay, because of the RAM. Yeah, it's just a trade off. I, I you know I really like the razor blade. I would say. Uh, it's the most, it's the sexiest of these. And given that you want light, I think it's a good choice. So that's probably, yeah, and they started a thousand. And that's CES. Uh, yeah, that's right. CES, we saw a lot of gaming laptops. The other thing I like that I really do like about um, the Alienware and the Razer uh, is that they are powerful enough to run virtual reality headsets. And that's something I think that you should consider when you buy a, a computer these days. Is can it run an HTC Vive or an Oculus Rift? You may not be buying it right away. Uh, but the fact that they can is, I think, Sorry, is a good sign. Sorry, my Echo heard me say the word computer, and she gets very, very jealous. Um, so it, it's, it's, you know, surf, it's, the Warcraft is not a tough game to run. It'll run on almost anything, even, you know, including something like Microsoft Surface Pro 4. So it really it really comes down to. Uh, I think your echo woke up too. Sorry. <laughs> really comes down to what compromises you want to make. You know, you can make a list. <laughs> Battery life. You want that to be higher, then you're going to have power lower. Uh, portability also generally affects battery life. There's just not as much room, and so forth. If I were going to pick a game, if I were going to get a gaming laptop. Right now, I'd probably get the razor blade. Oh, it's it's pretty sweet. It's pretty sweet. Uh, if you have an opinion, uh, give us a ring eighty eight eighty eight. Ask Leo. This is one of those subjects everybody has an opinion on. What's the best laptop? Do you notice that it's easy to have an opinion on the on the uh, stuff that is simple? <laughs> Everybody's got an opinion on what kind of potato chip is the best, right? Because anybody can have that opinion. What's the best gaming laptop? Everybody can have an opinion on that. A little more complicated when you you know say, well, should you get an i7 or an i5 microprocessor? Which one is the best and why? And it gets more complicated. Sometimes you do pay extra for that label gaming, and you know if you want to save money, you could get a very what you should what I would do is go look at what is in a gaming laptop like the Razer Blade, make a note of the components, and then go somewhere like Dell or Lenovo or HP and see if you can match that it won't have, have the styling it probably won't have some of the components won't be available but you can get pretty close and you'll probably save a lot of money so that's another way to get something less expensive that will do many of the same things World of Warcraft is not a hard, not a difficult game to uh, to render um, and it's not easy either it's nice to have uh, nice to have a little bit more power Hey, thanks for calling. I appreciate it. Great to hear from you. Well, we're going to take a break. When we come back, let's see who will be next. Ben in San Diego will be next. He's having trouble with Outlook. Oh, oh, okay, <laughs> okay. I got to. I have to. I have to gear up for this one. Let me go get a Snickers or something because I got to. I can get my brain working for an Outlook question. Somebody in the chat room saying MSI makes a good low cost gaming laptop. I like MSI laptops. My friend Trey Ratcliffe, the photographer who has abandoned Macintosh, I talked about this a couple of weeks ago, decided to get a high-end PC laptop to do Lightroom and Photoshop, and he bought one from MSI. So they've been making motherboards for years, but they're making some pretty good hardcore hardware. It's not, it's not, you know, the nice thing about the Razer, it glows, it's got multicolored keys, it's very sexy looking. An MSI computer is going to be very utilitarian looking, but maybe that, maybe you don't care. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888 Ask Leo. Mobile World Congress begins in Barcelona tomorrow. Samsung will have its keynote address uh, at 1 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, I will be uh, covering it on our podcast network. I'm going to come in a little bit before the radio show and uh, do that and uh, see what they have to announce. They won't announce, Samsung apparently won't announce new phones at Mobile World Congress. Typically, new phones are what Mobile World Congress is all about. 
But Samsung has decided it's a, and I think this is a growing trend. It's a little noisy at these trade shows. Everybody's announcing new phones. There'll be new Motorola phones, new LG phones. And Samsung's a big enough name, like Apple, they can have their own event. So they're going to announce uh, the new Samsung Galaxy S8 next month for availability in uh, April. And then I guess there'll be a Note 8 as well. Samsung says, yeah, we're going to do a Note. We're not going to abandon that, even though it exploded on everybody. We're going to, we're going to boy, the, you know, I was just looking at uh, some brand ranking surveys, and Samsung really took a big hit. Big hit because of those Note 7 explosions. And, of course, announcements every time you got on a plane. If you've got a Samsung phone, a lot of times they wouldn't know that it's the Note 8 specifically. They'd look at any Samsung phone and say, oh, you can't bring that on the plane. It was just a mess. It's so bad for the brand. But they're going to try to recover, and uh, they have enough money to market the heck out of it, so they maybe they will. They'll make their announcement of, of tablets tomorrow. But we do expect new phones. The Motorola G5, I'm, as you know, a big fan of the G4. The G5 will be announced sometime in the next few days in Barcelona. LG will announce its G6. You want to fly a G6, you can. So we'll keep an eye on, uh, on things. But the beginning of the uh, Mobile World Congress starts. It all starts with the press conferences, which begin tomorrow. And I'll have I'll have all that news for you. Don't worry. You don't have to get up early and figure out what's going on. Just tune in the show. That's it. Brett's next from Woodbridge, New Jersey. Hi, Brett. Brett, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Mr. Funny Guy, Leo. Um, <laughs> my question is, I have Windows 10 and the clock is messed up, and I change the time in the BIOS, and every day it shows three hours behind because I'm Eastern Standard Time. So I called Microsoft, and they said um, that it, it's the CMOS. Yeah, they're thinking that your battery's dead. No, I checked the battery. Well, uh, yeah, because it's, it sounds like it's keeping time. It's just the wrong time zone, right? Well, there is no Eastern Standard Time when I check in Windows 10. There's only Pacific U.S. Oh, there's definitely Eastern Standard Time. <laughs> you sure? Yeah. There's def so what you're going to do is you're going to go to the control panel and, and, and make sure you've got the correct region uh, set, and then you're going to look for the, the time settings. Where do I go from control panel? Well, actually, you probably, let me just see. I bet you you can uh, just tap on the... Um, uh, the time in your task manager. Let's see if I can do that. And and yeah, right click it. Right click it. Adjust, adjust date adjust time. time and date. Yeah, and it says okay, what time wait. zone. And you say you only see Pacific, but I, I if I scroll up, I'm sure I can see. Uh, or I just scroll down, I can see. Uh, UTC Pacific. Yeah, you want UTC minus five. That's Eastern time. So okay. So, so what do I just scroll down till you get to get to UTC minus five. You might be going the wrong direction. If you Oh I see a minus nine, minus eight. Yeah, you want to go down to minus five. Wait, let me see if I see it though. Um minus two. No, you're going too far. Minus five. Somewhere in between there. Make sure you pick that. Yeah, they, you know what, they they thought and in fact when you first as anytime somebody says, Oh, I think that there's something wrong with the time my first thought is, well, how old is a computer? Because there's a battery in there, little in most cases, a little coin-sized battery uh, that can be replaced. Those are inexpensive uh, batteries you can buy at the drugstore. And it backs up the time and date settings and other settings, very important settings about what kind of hard drive, what kind of hardware, and so forth. Uh, they, they back that up in an area of non-volatile, uh, well, uh, of volatile memory that needs to be refreshed by a battery. And uh, time is critical. If your time gets off, all sorts of things stop working, including things like you know, internet certificates. But you said something critical, which is it's it's keeping time. They didn't hear you say that, or the notebook didn't say that. It's keeping time. It's just three hours off. That means you're in the wrong time zone. So um, if you go to the date and time settings in your control panel, in time zone, you want to go for... Eastern, it's UTC, which stands for Universal Coordinated Time. I know the letters are screwed up because it's in French. 
Universal Team Coordinate or something. I don't know what it is. But UTC, which is, you know, former Greenwich Mean Time or, you know, the, uh, the, the, the definitive time. We're all some offset of that. Pacific time is eight hours offset during our uh, standard time. And you're in Eastern, which is five hours. So it's minus five, UTC minus five. And once you get there, it should be okay. I hope. Moving on to Chris in Miami. Hey, Chris, how you doing? Hey, long time no speak, my friend. My buddy, old buddy, old pal. We're still waiting for you to come to Miami. You know, we got the my, the port of Miami is wide open. We're waiting for you to cruise on in. I'm coming to Miami. Well, we'll see. <laughs> I'm hoping to come to Miami on my way to Cuba at the end of the year. But I'm feared now because of all of the uh, new restrictions that I won't be able to get back in the country. Well, you know me, so you can get back in. <laughs> I, I'm going to say, I know Chris. Let me in. Oh. Do you know anybody with Customs and Border Patrol? Do you know anybody there? No, I don't, actually, but I'll work on it real quick. Would you get some friends? I, mean, I do have friends. You know, every time I come into San Francisco, uh, for many years, a guy would come, come up and say, I knew you were coming in. Say, How you doing? I still, you know, I still had to get frisked, but I, but, but yeah, he's a fan, and so I'm hoping. Actually, you know what? The last time I came into Miami, I came in from, um, uh, the from NASA in the Bahamas, and I had, I'm okay. I'm gonna admit it now. I think the statute of limitations is expired. I had purchased some Cuban cigars in nice. NASA, yeah, and I was, I was sweating. I mean, I was a little scared coming into Miami. And I was thrilled because we were going through the inspections, and somebody says, "Oh, Leo, how you doing? Big fan of the show." And he said, "Come on through." Yeah. And I went, "Whoo." Yeah. Whoo. I, you know, so I, but, but I guess when I go to Cuba, I'm going to be very because I think they look at your where have you been, and that that's probably a red flag. So I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how that's going to work out. We'll find out at the end of the year. Anyway, I'm sorry. What can I do for you, Chris? Okay, so um, I'm having this issue with uh, the speech recognition. Now, I had sent you an email uh, via PGP on Feb 18. Good man. I never got a reply back. From yeah. You, but I, Do you know how much email I get, Chris? I'm so I know, sorry. I, know, I, know, I apologize. I, okay. I'm like, um, I wanted to ask you, though, because in here, uh, in, the PG, in, the, in the GPG keychain, um, I have you in here at Leo at Leoville, but it says it was created on April 12, 2014, but it's all it's only like two yellow. That one's correct. So actually, let me take a break. When we come back, because this is a uh, another subject I think people are interested in, how you send email securely. Now, email normally is like sending a postcard. Anybody along the way can read it. Uh, if you want to be private, and Chris apparently does, there are ways to protect your privacy, but it's a little complicated. We'll talk about it when we come back. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Chris, let me open up your uh, email. Pro part of the problem is that I can only read your email on a few of my computers. I don't have um, the right email program on this one, for instance. Mm -hmm. So if it's encrypted, I have to get my Mac at home. Well, as long as your key is current, it says 2014. Yeah, that's so, that, so yeah. And so here's the trick, and I'll explain this when we come back, but um, I foolishly made, I've been making PGP keys since 2005, but when I made them foolishly, I didn't put a, a I didn't keep track of the revocation password or get a revocation certificate. And so I can't revoke these old keys. Most of them I still can use if you use them. I, I can, but some, not all of them. Some of them I don't remember how, what the passphrase was. So it's best, and it's always best in general to use the, the most recent key, which is the 2014 key. Okay. okay. And, uh, and so I'm sure I got it. I just can't read it until I get home. But because um, I can read, I'll be, I can see that I got an email from you, but it's right. gobbledygook. But that's a good test to do. To, in fact, I encourage people to send me. And the way, you know, encrypted email, and I can verify that it's working properly. The way to do it is to go to my website, uh, leolaporte.com. There's a link, PGP link there, and that's the most current key. Okay. That's where I went. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So um, is that the question, or do you want to hang on? Oh, we well, yeah. well, no, because I was, my main problem with, with Apple has been the uh, com.apple speech recognition core speech recognized issue in Activity Monitor. It's using like well over a gig worth of memory, and I have eight going to 16, but I mean, not even the engineers seem to be able to figure this out. Maybe you might, might not have an answer for me. So Speech recognition is one of those things that is memory intensive. In fact, 
it got much better as we started getting more memory. Uh, what because what what speech recognition needs to do to be timely to keep up with you is keep a big vocabulary in RAM. So um, I don't think that's a bug. I think that's that they're going to use as much RAM as they can. Now, using a gig if you've got eight is not the end of the world. No, no, but it you should expect it to use. Bit, yeah, no, you should expect it to use a lot. Okay. And that's when speech recognition started becoming really good. When Dragon and others could really start using a lot of RAM, uh, it was noticeably better because the vocab has to be kept in memory for it to quickly follow what you're saying. Oh, okay, that's interesting. I never knew that. Apparently, the people you talked to didn't either. No, it happened all the way up to <laughs> But that's why you call me. So yeah. you got PGP working. I, I, you know, I gave you kind of a bad answer uh, when you called because when I read the page at PGP Tools more closely, I saw it just didn't – it does. It works with Sierra. It just doesn't work with the updated Sierra Mail. But you've got it working now, I, I take it. Yeah, well, there's a, there has been an update. They sent out right. an update. And, 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 and this uh, happens PGP. every single time. Apple updates mail, breaks PGP, which drives me right. crazy. Yep, yep. And then a few months later, they go, they come up with a fix for it. But the fix in the meantime, you could still use GPG on Sierra. It just wouldn't integrate smoothly with Apple mail. You'd have to do it manually, that's all. I've had no trouble. They updated it so that yeah. it actually works now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, use it on, I use it on MailMate, but I use it on Apple. That was my other solution is, I don't use Apple Mail. I use a program called MailMate on the Mac, okay. which which also supports GPG as well as SMIME. And um, it's kept much more up-to-date than Apple keeps mail. Oh, yeah, Mac Mail makes me crazy. Yeah. Try MailMate. You had, it's not free, but there's a free trial. I really like MailMate. I'll give it a try. All right. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Leo. See ya. You too. He's been everywhere, man. He's Johnny Jet, our traveling guru. He joins us each and every week to talk about traveling like a... I notice it's not a rock star anymore. It's a movie star. It's a movie star, yeah. <laughs> JohnnyJet.com, the king of travel of all kinds. But he's been homebound for the last few months because, well, he's got a new baby. Little little Jackie Jet. <laughs> so, uh, hello, Johnny. Jack Jet. Jack, not Jackie. Not Jackie. Come on. You don't ever call him Jackie or JJ? JJ, but not Jackie. JJ's good. I like that. JJJ. Yeah, but I, although I've been traveling and I am traveling again. I'm speaking um, this weekend at the San Diego, next weekend at the San Diego Travel and Adventure Show. And then I'll be at a, a lot of those shows all around the country, Philadelphia, Dallas, nice. Denver. And you did, what was it, Chicago last week? Where I did were, Chicago. Yeah. I did uh, LA last week, New York a couple few weeks nice. ago. And your and so, your talk is travel like a movie star, without movie star money. Ah, uh -huh, that's the key. That is the key. That's the key. And uh, see, so you, you know, one of my tips is like how to find cheap fares. And by the way, I hope you noticed or jumped on it. I sent a special deals newsletter right when I uh, read about it. Norwegian Air Air Shuttle they released sixty five dollar fares across the pond. Uh, I've been meaning to ask you about that. Yeah, you could fly f from the U S. to Europe. For as little as sixty nine dollars, what's the catch, Johnny? It was just great marketing. It's and it's and it's. You don't have uh, to pay for every piece of luggage. You don't have to pay to oh wear no, shoes. Oh no, you do. You do. You do. You the. You know. They're they're known as like Ryanair and Spirit, one of the low, 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 low cost airlines in Europe, right? For sure. Yeah. Without a doubt. But again, if you can travel lightly and and read all the rules before you get on their plane, find out what their fees are. They're incredible deals. I mean, yeah. $65 one way, including all taxes. So, but wow. it was from uh, New York. So, Stewart Airport, they fly out. Or they fly out of smaller what? airports like Stewart. Stewart. I never even heard of Stewart. Yeah, well, Do they have jets? Yes, of course. It's a 737 <laughs> and they fly out. Oh, it's a little uh, so jet. So, it's 3 3. Yeah. It's a smaller plane. It's yeah. not like your normal going across the Atlantic. Yeah. But uh, that's 70 miles north of New York City. But they oh, also fly okay. out of Providence, which oh. you were very yes, familiar with. TF Green, yeah, TV and they also Green. fly out of Bradley in Hartford. Ah. and then but, where do you? Just, anywhere, just out of curiosity, where in Europe do you end up? Uh, they're flying to Dublin. They're oh. flying to Shannon. I think so that's Cork. a great deal. But this is so oh, it's a promotional I, deal. It's not going to last very long, right? I mean, this this can't be their regular fare. It, it's not their regular fare, but their regular fares are really cheap. But I just brought up uh, Copen L.A. to Copenhagen. For November, and there's fares for one ninety nine, and you can also same thing out of. Um, I think they fly out of Oakland. That's that's one way. On that. 
Those are one way, but yeah. still. So, so it's Oakland they fly. Four hundred dollars round trip, but it's still a great a great deal. But again, whenever you fly these low fare carriers, you got to make sure you're not bringing a lot of bags on right. or checking a lot of bags. Right. Because they'll ch they charge you for the bags, they charge you for the food. Do they charge you for Drinks. the toilet? No, they can't do that. No, Brian Air joked about it, but they they, they, they never they have. made a joke. I remember that. Yeah, correct. Um, but they get you. I mean, they, they they you'll find if you have carry on, they charge you, right? Some I don't think Norwegian does. Spirit but a lot of charged me for carry on. Spirit does. Yeah, they'll charge you up to a hundred dollars. Spirit, if you wait till the, till you get to the gate. Also, Frontier charges for uh, Frontier charges for uh, carry on. See, it feels and like now, it's a it's a game they're playing because they got a cheap fair up front but they know they're going to get you well just this past week united and american started selling their low fare their economy fares so when you when you buy these cheap tickets you really need to read the fare rules because united will not let you bring a carry-on to go in the overhead bin you can bring like a purse to put underneath the seat an american if you want to bring a bag on the in the overhead bin if you're buying the super cheap fare on certain markets it's uh, they charge, I think, it's twenty five dollars. Wow! So, wow! Always read these fares now. It's not just the low fare carriers you have to worry about. But yeah, yeah. Sp speaking of traveling, yeah, um, all around the world, my website this week is called The Earth Awaits. So T H E Earth and then awaits a w a i t s dot com. So I was speaking at one of these shows and someone came up to me and said, "Hey, I want to retire overseas. Where should I go?" And I said, "Well." I'm actually not an expert on it, but I do know that a lot of people, a lot of Americans like living in Mexico or Thailand because it's super cheap. Well, this website I just read about in the LA Times last week from Jen Leo, who I know, know is a fan of your show. Um, she wrote it, and it's a great site for if you want to live overseas. You could do it for however long you want, but you just put in how much you want to spend a month, um, you know, how many people, how many bedrooms. If you want to live in the city or outside the city, if you want low crime, high crime, obviously you don't want high crime or or the pollution this is level. Good. I can and plan then, my retirement here. This is good. Yeah. You know what it's they're missing? I wish they had is health care. Yeah, you, you know, know, I don't think they have health care. But on the next page, it does have you has um, what the broadband is, the speed. That's so, important. That is That's important. That's important. Wow. And, this is cool. And so they show so, you where I can move to Irvine. <laughs> there, this Irvine is is like Fremont, California. So it's not just uh, overseas. It's it's, it's everywhere. not just overseas. Well, you checked. So right Melbourne, before you went Florida, to this page, Hamilton, to New Zealand, the, where you want to live. Yeah, so yeah. I, I didn't effort. eliminate the United States because I, you know, hey, I might want to stay here. Boulder's good. This is good. Yeah, Boulder. The Boulder's a popular My city. My son lives in Boulder. I love Boulder. So All how right. much did you put in, by the way, for a monthly? Uh, I think it, uh, I don't remember. Was it five thousand? Because you get to there's a slider where you get to choose how much your monthly budget is. Yeah, and I also went, how I you want as much as five thousand dollars. Okay, and I put then, five thousand, but I put opulent. I want to live. You want to live, live like opulent? I said modest. Yeah. So let me try opulent. Okay. Crime yeah. rate low. Population. Oh, a pollution. Yep. I mean. Pollution. Pollution. No, low. I don't want high pollution. Let's say low. Okay. And I don't apartment type. I don't care. One bedroom, city center. Well, yeah, no, probably. Dude, no, dude. one bedroom. All right, no, two. Be all right, Johnny's getting me costing more and more. All right, let's see now. Let's see where yeah, I should. Now it, it, there won't be so much in America. I think there's one shows up in Arkansas, Fayetteville. Uh, ooh, Melbourne, like Florida. It. Yeah, Heidelberg. I'd like to go to Heidelberg. That's a pretty yes. town. That's a pretty. It is town. beautiful in Germany. Low crime rate, low pollution. Nice town, Raleigh, North Carolina. Love Raleigh. This is, these are good choices, yeah. Ann Arbor. And, and again, and you could have just put South America if you wanted, yeah. or just Europe or well, Asia. Well, I want to see the full you... range of options. Right. This is a good idea. I, w I would like to see healthcare and internet in there, but that you say their internet is in here. I, I actually think they do put uh, healthcare in, but you have to pay for it. Uh -huh. so to... Those are the things you so really care about. They have about. an upcharge. Yeah. yeah. So right. I did see you know, more stats the and Earth stuff like that. Awaits. The Earth awaits. You know what I thought would be kind of fun is living on a cruise boat. Is there such a thing where you could just Move Without in. Without a doubt. Of course. Well, <laughs> one ship made a lot of news, I think, a decade ago called The World. Yeah, it was like a condo. Condo exact. ship. Condo cruise ship. But it doesn't matter what cruise line. Pretty much every cruise line will sell you a cabin oh, for really? a year round. Oh. And I think we've talked about this before. Is it a good deal? Or is it you have to pay the normal rate? You get it. You can definitely get a deal. I should get you a deal because I'm no. buying a whole year. For sure. I, I, I've been on cruises where... Everyone knows this one person because they live they on the live ship. They live there. 
And it's and you know, depending on your lifestyle, it could be a lot cheaper than nice. living in a in a senior center home. I would love to do it. Listen, I got to make enough money so I could, you know, live on Seaborn all year round. <laughs> I think it'd get boring after a while. I, but I, I don't, don't know. know. I don't know. I'm, I'm willing Go to try. I'll be a guinea pig. I what, definitely would gain a lot of weight. The world awaits.com. Good choice. That's yes. Great. Do you have an app for us? We got about 50 I seconds do. left. 50 seconds? Yeah. Um, Give me a quick app. I don't have an app that quick in time. Okay, then save tip. it. How about this? Yeah. How about a tip? Okay. So a lot of people, especially to Mexico, you know, don't use ATM machines that are on the street or in a convenience store or even in a hotel. Go to the bank. Use it. Yeah. You got to go to the bank where yeah. indoors, not outside. You don't want to use be ATM skimmers. on the outside. And that's true even in the U.S. now. That's everywhere. I was going to say, not yeah. just Mexico, but pretty much all over. So yeah. always, always look for the skimmers or go to a... Um, you know, a, a well-known bank and go inside. Indoors. Go inside. Inside. That's the important part. Johnny Jet. If you are not following Johnny Jet on Instagram or Twitter, you're missing great stuff. And of course, his website is johnnyjet.com. Got those travel newsletters. Lots of great stuff. Free. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Nice advice. Eighty-eight, eighty-eight. Ask Leo the phone number. <laughs> Uh, let's move on with more calls here. And uh, Greg on the line from Redlands, California. Hi, Greg. Hey, Leo. Um, I got a, about a five-year-old XPS laptop um, about two years ago. Upgraded the hard drive and uh, the optical drive to a couple solid states and, and put in some two, two eight gigs of RAM for 16 total. Um, but for lack of a better term, things are just getting weird. I know, you know, components are going out. I know my integrated oh, cards rats. getting worn out. So I'm looking at buying a new laptop, and my question was, I know things like hard drives have rewrite capacity to gauge, you know, their health. But what about RAM? Is there anything keeping me from just swapping those 16 gigs out in my new laptop? Do you want to test it, you're saying, or do you want to swap it? No, I just, yeah, to save some money, can I just take those 16 gigs from my current laptop and plug them into my new uh, one? And probably not, there. but you no. but you you got to figure it out. So there's a few factors involved here. Um, it's not like a hard drive. There's nothing on the RAM, so you don't have to worry about, co you know, copying anything over or anything like that. But it has to be exactly the right RAM. So the form factor has to be the same. Most nowadays, most laptops, uh, if they have removable RAM, because we're seeing more and more laptops with RAM soldered onto the motherboard. You can neither upgrade them nor remove them. But if you have removable RAM, it'll be something called an SO DIM. And that's a standard probably your new laptop supports. But you got to make sure, in other words, physically it fits in the slots. And then the second issue is speed. And that's a little more tricky. The best way to figure it out is to uh, figure out what you've got now. And then what you need. And you can do that. Most of the RAM sites like Crucial and Kingston actually have RAM pickers. You can enter the model and the, and of the laptop, the date, and all that stuff. And it'll tell you exactly what kind of RAM it will use. You know, SO DIM DDR3 at 120 milliseconds. or so. But you need to match it pretty closely. If the, if the timing is off, that could cause reliability issues. So... Okay. Um, it's just a question of making sure they're compatible. But if that's the case, if it's you know if it's compatible, yeah, you just take it out of the old and put it in the new one. We used to do that all the time, but that but times have changed and and, and technology advanced quite a bit. And now even in a couple of years, laptops will have changed the speed and timing of the RAM. Okay, perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for the call. Yeah, and there's nothing with a hard drive. You got to think about what's on the hard drive. You want to take the old, but this is there's nothing in the RAM. The RAM. Without power, it loses all its uh, contents. Yeah, Apple solders on RAM, and I think more and more you're seeing companies to save money, save space uh, doing this, and uh, it's a bad trend. But if you think about it, we, we, we're we demanding faster, sl lighter, thinner computers, and that's how you get all of that is you, you put more and more on the motherboard, basically. Uh, you know, having a socket makes it much more uh, challenging. From San Diego, Ben is next. Hi, Ben. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Man, I got lucky. 
getting on the show. That's yeah, it's fun. just it's kind of yeah, it's like Vegas. It's, you pull the pull the handle and take a spin. What can I do for you? My question is, I I finally switched everything to Mac in about 2011, and I have issues syncing my Microsoft. Uh, I'm using Outlook for Mac, okay, which is basically a crippled version of Outlook, and I'm having trouble syncing with iCal. I would I would like to be able to sync with iCal uh, either through Outlook. Being able to set up something in an Outlook calendar. Yeah, so Outlook has its own calendar, right? And um, address book as well as email. And yeah, and I'm, yeah. It's, it's easy enough to export it, but syncing it is a little uh, more tricky. Uh, and I haven't looked at this lately. In the past, you've had to buy a third party sync tool. You know what I would do, though? This should work, is use uh, Google's calendar as an intermediary. So you can sync oh, between them. Yeah, so but I'm you, using Exchange, which I thought if I was using Exchange. Oh yeah, you should be able to. Use, okay, so you have so you have a company's Exchange server somewhere, or how are you using Exchange? Yeah. Oh, all right. My company, my yeah. company has Exchange, and it, you know what? It used to work, and then it seems like it broke. You know, with yeah. different updates or something, and yeah. I don't know at what point it broke. You know, because I just don't pay that close of attention to it. Uh, according to uh, the internets, it broke with a, a, the 10.10.2 update. <laughs> uh, so fairly recently. Um, is that El Capitan or is that before that? Uh, that I think is El... It's, is it El Capitan or is it Yosemite? It's pretty recent. Um, so I can read you the steps. I'm going to put this in the show notes at techguylabs.com. It's from an Apple discussions thread. But I'll, 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 tell oh, okay. you the, I'll tell you the steps, and then you can... It's basically, you've got to clear the calendar cache. Uh, and then uh, you've got to uh, restart iCal, rebuild the caches. And then, as you did before, turn on your Exchange calendar. Apparently, this okay. did fix it for a num number of people. Um, you oh, also okay. maybe have to stop the calendar agent process, but I'm going to put what this is complicated. So what I'm going to do, and I, you know, yeah. obviously you're driving, you don't want to. I'm I'm putting this in the show notes. Uh, our James Deruvo, who's watching carefully, listening to everything I say, and writing it all down, is going to put this in the show notes for you at TechGuyLabs.com, and that's really the best way to do this because then you can read oh, the, the details and all of that stuff. Okay. That's great. That's, so when did it much. stop? When did it stop working for you? Fairly recently. It was fairly recently. Yeah. yeah. This is probably that problem, that specific issue. Yeah, you know, I'm. Yeah, it's, I, it seems like Apple is. Uh, I, I've been wanting to switch to Apple for a long time, and I finally did. And I spent a lot of money. And it's like Outlook for Mac. When when do you do you have any? Uh, I don't uh, use Outlook. Uh, you know, it's a Microsoft product, and. I just I prefer not to, but you you kind of need to because your company is uh, it sounds like an all Windows company, including running an Exchange server. So you're kind of well, I'm the one that convinced them to run Exchange so I could sync my calendar. Actually. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you also have to make sure that I that so, that the folks at work turn on that uh, Cal Sync feature. They obviously did because it worked for a while. So yeah, yeah. yeah so it's so just well. I think this is that ten point two ten point two update and. This is a fairly simple fix. Yeah, it's a. It sounds like it's a bug that uh, that you have to clear yeah, the caches. Apple's now it seems like for the masses when they used to be. I'm very uh, disappointed in the direction they Apple's. Big Brother in 1984. Yeah, I know. Yeah, they were for the. In fact, that was their slogan: "The computer for the rest of us." That was the commercial. Yeah, and I think that what's happened uh, is the iPhone. The iPhone was such a success, uh, and Apple can't ignore it. That all of their resources, all of their attention is on the iPhone and now on finding the next thing the next the success of the iPhone. And so they've let the they frankly I think let the Mac slide a little bit. Which is it is a shame because so it was nice People to have that mobile all, now predominantly. Anyway. Everybody's using a, a phone. That's the number one computer. They don't use tablets, they don't use desktops, they don't use laptops, they use their phones. So That's Apple's true. putting all its eggs all in that basket. PowerPoint presentations from an <laughs> from a, um, uh, iPad. My problem is you can do it but it's it's yeah. harder, and so I don't see why, as a user, I should have to kind of s stuff myself 
into that, you know, that my square peg into that round hole. I should use the tool mm -hmm. that's right for the job. But unfortunately, um, Apple is so committed to, for instance, everybody should stop using computers and start using iPads. They've been spending a lot of energy promoting the iPad as your next laptop. And yeah, you can, but it's not the best solution. It really is disappointing to me, I think. Right. I agree. Yeah. I share your I share your disappointment. Now, in this case, uh, Microsoft is partly complicit. Uh, make sure you're using the latest version of Office. And uh, and then if you go to techguylabs.com, that's our website. I have a link that I've put in here. This is show 1,366. The way the website's organized, it's, it's by show and then within each show by hour and then within in each hour, the caller. So you're the last caller in the second hour. <laughs> and and uh, you'll see right there your your, your question, uh, my answer, and then uh, James will put a link um, in the show notes. I've just pasted it in the chat so he has access to it, to that discussion uh, thread from Apple's support pages that looks like it's exactly uh, what you're talking about. Thank you for the call. I appreciate it. Sorry to keep you on hold for so long. 8888-ASK-LEO. I know a lot of you are uh, still on hold. We're going to have a lot more calls, and I'm going to give you uh, my full attention Anne Marie is coming up in just a bit from Orange County. Wants to know what the best computer is for video editing. Roger in L.A. He can't connect to his Wi-Fi. He's trying to figure out what, what's going on. And Evangeline in Virginia Beach. Can an old admin ex still ex access her computer and delete her files? Mm -hmm. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, will, will answer all those calls in just a bit. Our show today, my friends, brought to you by Rocket Mortgage from the number one, the best mortgage lender in the country quicken loans now i say they're the best they're not the biggest they're the second biggest i think they have like 93 billion dollars in loans uh that they've written uh but they are the best in terms of customer satisfaction and all it takes is one look at quickenloans.com slash tech guy and all those jd power customer satisfaction awards year after year after year the most beloved mortgage lender and here's a reason i love them Last time I did a loan, I did not go to Quicken Loans. It was about three or four years ago. Uh, we went to a local uh, lender here. It took us, I've told this story before, like six weeks. We were, we were on vacation faxing paperwork. We thought, oh, this will be done. You know, we started like three or four weeks before we left. But, but, but we, the house was in, we were buying it. It was in process. And this was the last piece of the puzzle. And we, we, had, we went on vacation. We just kind of kept faxing them stuff. It just went on and on and on. It was terrible experience. I could tell you, next time we buy a house or if we refi, we will be going to quickenloans.com slash tech guy because they've got a product that's complete opposite. It's called Rocket Mortgage. And, and just like a rocket, it implies speed, right? But also 21st century technology. It's all online. The entire mortgage approval process is on a computer. Not just a computer. You can do it on your phone. And it's fast because, it, well, computers, you could get approved in minutes, not weeks, minutes. So if you go to quickenloans.com slash tech guy, you will get a transparent process. This is important, too. You've got to have a mortgage lender you, not only you trust, but that you understand exactly what's going on. And Quicken Loans makes that very easy. They have, you have buttons. You can choose your rate, choose your term, customize it exactly as you need it. And make sure you've got a solution that's right for you. You'll get approval in minutes for, for a solution that's tailored to your financial situation. You can even submit the paperwork you need, things like uh, 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 you know bank statements and check stubs, all that, online with a touch of a button. It's, it couldn't be simpler. And minutes later, you know. Great, by the way, if you they this is actually a really good use of it. If you're sometimes you drive by and you go, wow, there's that house is for sale. I've always wanted that house. Or look at that. Or you go to open houses because it's kind of fun and you go, hey, we should buy this house. Now that house is already on the market. You need to get pre-approved for that loan right away before you make an offer. You can literally do that at the open house and show the realtor. We're approved, by the way. I mean, that is huge. Gives you a huge advantage. Quickenloans.com slash tech guy. For Rocket Mortgage, equal housing lender licensed in all 50 states, nmlsconsumeraccess.org, number 3030. Rocket Mortgage, quickenloans.com slash tech guy. We thank them for their support of the Tech Guy podcast. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches, and all that jazz. 8888. 
Ask Leo, that's the phone number, 8888. Ask Leo if you have a question, a comment, a suggestion. Anne Marie is next in Orange. Hi, Anne Marie. Hi, how are you today? I'm great. Thanks for calling. Welcome. Thank you. So, my husband and I started an internet television network. About what? That's the awesome. An anniversary coming up. Thank you. That's... And we're doing really well. And we've been editing our videos. We video, we um, tape about 30 to 50 30 minute shows every week. What? Where and can I find this uh, network? It's it's called the Holy Spirit Broadcasting Network. It's uh, at hsbn.tv. Awesome. And do you do it out of your house? Do you have a studio? Where do you do it? We have a very small, we have a small studio in Orange, and then we have one in Mesa. We are um, talking to people in uh, Florida. We've got um, broadcasting coming in from. Canada, from See, Uganda. What's, what's interesting is, of course, you know, you, you could do this if, uh, on television networks if you could buy time or find somebody to carry you. But the Internet means anybody can do this via the Internet. And, you, you, you know, you get to Uganda by the Internet, right? Everywhere. You might additionally, it sounds like you're doing this, add traditional television to it. But, you, but, well, but we might, except for it seems like traditional television is kind of going away. Yeah. Why not just be on the internet? I do an internet television network on technology, uh -huh. and and that's how we distribute. It's all on the internet. Well, one of the great things about our network is we've taken the time clock out of it. So if a, a pastor's on on Monday, he can talk as long as he wants. <laughs> well, not not that part. But <laughs> that's what I do. <laughs> regular. If you're on regular television, maybe you're on at 10 a.m. Right. Pacific Standard Time. Right. This is like if I want to tell somebody to go to watch my show, they can, and I'm on Monday, they can just go through and pick my icon. And it's on. Go, it's on. We call on demand. Right. Well, then, but then we also have an on demand. Um, well, what we call so, on demand. So you do you, you do you do live streaming as well? We're not doing it right now, but we're looking into doing some more of that. Yeah. So that's kind of what we do. The way we do the live streaming is it's not really a television show. It's you're watching the show being made because it's unedited. And right. then and then we take it and we edit it and we put it out just as you do. for uh, You can watch it at any time on the website. We have, yeah, we have had a little bit of problem with that in the past. And um, people... Uh, starting to say stuff that yes. we didn't want to go out there. <laughs> yes, you. Yes, in <laughs> fact, we have. Uh, we didn't have it. I just had, had uh, instructed our engineers to put a warning on our calendar saying, "A, times are f you know flexible and subject to change because you know things happen and it's not a television <laughs> network. Sometimes you know I arrive later, the equipment's not working or whatever. And B, these are these are unedited and we can't promise that uh, you know everything you hear and see is." Is what we want you to. If you want to be the controlled version, you're going to watch the edited version. So what can I do? I think this is great. And this is what's so exciting about the Internet is it makes distribution available to everyone. Well, see, and, and, and we have an app. We did have a Roku channel, but um, the people we went through kind of ripped us off. So yeah, that happens. Getting Roku within yeah. the next 30 to 60 yeah. days back again. We ended up buying, buy, paying somebody to write an app for us, too. That's what, yeah, there are a lot of different ways uh, to do this. But that makes right. it easier for your parishioners, or your, your viewers, because they can get a Roku and an app, and they can keep you on and watch. Right. And with the Internet, if I, if I was going to go TV, I'd have to buy satellite. I'd have to be right. here. I'd have to be there. It's very expensive. With Internet. With no advertising, we're now being watched in like 185 countries. Congratulations. By like 30 million people. Isn't that amazing? So, Congratulations. It's amazing. Thank that you. That is wonderful. That is Thank just you. That is just wonderful. Well, what can I do to help? Okay, so currently in our Orange studio, this is our home base, we're filming about 30 to 50, 30 minute shows a week, and then we got to edit. And um, <laughs> well, you do more than I do. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, I, I thought 25 a week was a lot. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah, so we've got like a line of five, t uh, five laptops sitting there on the desk, and we're running back and forth from 
computer, and I'm not doing the editing, and I don't know a lot about it, but I'm just wondering if there's a a better setup for us. We, we're using um, PC, um, HP computers right now, yeah. and we're using Adobe Premiere, and I'm wondering if there's a desktop that would give us more power, because we yeah. can only do really one at a time. Yeah, and so then, this is, this is you're going to, we've solved all of these problems we had to over a period yeah. of 10 years. And this is a fairly complex setup, and I have some very good engineering staff. I'll tell you mm -hmm. kind of with broad brush how we do it. Um, okay. So we have studios set up. Um, mm -hmm. We record, and when we record it, we actually, uh, and we used to record it to a centralized fast hard drive called a SAN or storage area network that every editor could then access. And that was a good setup, but it was very, very expensive. We've actually gone backwards back to what they sometimes call sneaker net we record these on solid state drives we have a special device from sound devices that just records the video when the show is done the editor pops the cartridge out it's a hard drive and hand carry hand carries it down to his editing suite and edits it there believe it or not that turned out to be more efficient and more reliable and a lot less expensive uh, now, we do have backup recordings and so forth. The, we, uh, we ended up going out and buying Dell Precision Workstation desktops, very fancy desktops, and, uh, and running. we're using Adobe Premiere. I think that's a very good choice. And then there's a whole publishing back end that you have to do, too, because you have to get it up on the Internet site. And right. we, we spent a quarter of a million dollars on a back end that allowed the editors to upload it, and then uh, an automatic system would ingest the video and spit out the various forms we need to the various sites they go to youtube our own site uh and mm -hmm. and so that's somewhat automated and it has a big dashboard so the editors can see if it's worked or it's something they could see where something has failed and this has just evolved over time we end up spending quite a bit of money to do it but it's easily the most efficient way to do this laptops would be the least efficient way to do this right right so i think getting getting a few i don't know how many editors do you have we basically have two here in this location, and um, they're both part time. And then we have uh, we do have some of our broadcasters who are just dropboxing their edited videos yeah. to us. Yeah, yeah, you could do that. The problem is, of course, file sizes are big, and it takes a long time to do it. But I look at all the different uh, preachers you have. This is fantastic. You're obviously uh, really have have it together, and I'm thrilled that you found an audience. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, I think the easiest. I'll send you to one resource, and I don't know how up-to-date it is, but we have a wiki, which is a website created uh -huh. by users, by us and users, that describes the equipment we use. That will give you some starting point. That's wiki.twit, which is the name of my network, .tv. Uh -huh. Twit stands for This Week in Tech. So at wiki.twit.tv, you'll see a, a bunch of stuff on the front page, but one of them is how we make twit. And, it, and it, that has at least a, a little bit more in-depth discussion. You'd need to get uh, – do you have an engineer? Do you have somebody who handles all this stuff, or is yeah. it you? Yeah. No, we have an engineer in backward, back, backwards Kentucky or something. <laughs> That's crazy. great. If, you've, if, if you have a good engineer, uh, send him to that site. And, and if he wants to know more – Email me, uh, leo at uh, twit.tv or leo at techguylabs.com, and I will uh, send you to our engineers, and we can give you some more information about how we do it or maybe talk to him directly um, because we have basically solved this problem because no one else had ever done it before, and I think we've got a pretty good system. Congratulations on your good work. That's great. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. That's really neat that you've been able to... Oh, she's gone. Oh, well. That's pretty neat, huh? And she has a bunch of pastors. This is really amazing. It's very much like Twit, but for Christian broadcasting, basically. And then they have paid... You know, they can't... Obviously, they're not going to put advertising in there. So, that's really neat. That's really neat. Dr. Andrew and Pastor Anne-Marie Bills. And I guess we were talking to Anne-Marie. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888-ASK-LEO. I put a link in the show notes, techilabs.com for Anne-Marie, uh, to the equipment we use in our studio. I, I wish it were more uh, complete, 
nobody's really sat down and, and written up exactly how we do it. Everybody's too busy <laughs> doing it to uh, document it, and that's often a problem in that technology. Micro Stamp is in our chat room. Remember, he called last week with a slow, solid-state drive, and part of the debate was uh, whether it was an issue of trim not being uh, used on that drive. Uh, Micro Stamp was using a... Um, uh, third-party SSD and an Apple computer. He says, it turns out there was nothing wrong with the solid-state drive. It was just a bad external USB backup drive. And that's often the case, you know. Drives drives can... USB in particular can cause all sorts of problems. Uh, if you have trouble with a computing, computer booting up, for instance, I've learned over many years of unhappy experiences, the first thing I do is unplug all the USB devices Make sure none of them are causing a, a problem. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number. Roger in L.A. is next. Hi, Roger. Hi. How are you? Welcome. Oh, fine. Thank you. Uh, yes, the reason that I'm calling is that I just recently, within the last year, purchased uh, an Asus laptop, and it has Windows 10 on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's two strange things that's occurring. Number one, when I... Uh, Sleep. I mean, put the computer to sleep and close the lid. Then at times, when I open it up, it's reboot. It you know it it, it has to reboot or it does reboot. Yeah. Uh, so it actually it shuts off. And uh, I've been searching on the internet, and it seems as though other people have had that problem, but I haven't found a definitive way in which to address that issue. So and, you you uh, you're using the computer. It's fine. You shut it down, and it's not plugged in. Um, Normally, when you have the lid closed, it uh, puts it to sleep. But occasionally, not always, you'll open it up and it's and it reboots. Now, one, yeah, one I mean, sometimes I'll put it. Sometimes I will put it to sleep. Other times, I'll just close the lid. Yeah, and there's a setting in the power settings of what to do when the lid is closed, and the default is almost always put it to sleep. Right. Yeah. So there's a couple of low power states. There's really three low power states that all computers can go into one is off <laughs> and that's what's right, happened it's right. it's either rebooting or it, or it turned off the other two are sleep which is a the least low power state it turns off the screen it it powers down a few things but it does kind of it has to continue to refresh memory so power is still being used um it in many cases with modern operating systems periodically the computer will kind of wake up and get uh, get mail and things like that. There's another state which I generally don't recommend. A lot of computers have problems with called hibernate, which is as low power as off. It's effectively off, except it did one thing. Before it shut off, it saved the contents of RAM to the hard drive. When you hibernate, it takes a while to go to sleep, but then when you open up the lid, it wakes up from hibernation, is in effect turning on loading memory, and the advantage of that is it gets, it gets you back to where you were in the middle of whatever project you were in, but it does save the most power. Since you're going to sleep, it could be that p power is dying on you. Is it? Is it uh, an issue? Uh, I mean, I, I... You still have battery life when you, turn, when you turn it on and it's been rebooted? Well, I actually have the computer plugged in. Oh, okay. And so it's not, it's not an issue of and, that. And let me, let me ask you, is it that it has rebooted or does it actually reboot when you open the lid? Well, when I open the lid... And I push the key, like let's say if it's sleep sometimes. Yeah, you wake up the screen, and what is what is on the screen? Uh, nothing. It 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 just it re, it does reboot. You're basically saying start. Yeah. It's yeah. Like it's restarting. So yeah. it has shut down. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And what com what kind of computer is it? You said an Asus. An Asus. And how old is it? Uh, I purchased this like I believe it was less than a year ago. It's brand new Asus. Yeah, somebody in the chat room saying, oh, Windows 10 power and sleep issues. What a novel. <laughs> you know, <laughs> he's being sarcastic. It's a very, very, very common. Um, I'm not sure exactly what's uh, going on here. You know, the first place to look, and I bet you've already looked, is in your power settings. Yep. And yeah. all of those look normal, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so... It sounds like at some point during its sleep, it turns itself off. Right. And it doesn't say when you come back, oh, we had a crash. It just... Oh, no. It's as if you shut it off and it came back. Right. Yeah. Well, actually, sometimes what, what I'll have... I mean, it 
some if I have a program running, then it will act as though it crashed. So in other words, if I have, uh, you know, some a lot of times I put it to sleep and it has I'm running. Um, yeah, you have the browser have, open uh, or work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. then you know I get the oops and so on and so forth. So okay, that's interesting. So it so that's good. That means it wasn't an. This is a good clue. It wasn't an orderly shutdown. Whatever happened while the lid was closed. It wasn't an orderly shutdown because Firefox said, hey, I wasn't closed properly. Exactly. So what happens, it sounds like some point, it's not losing power because it's plugged in. That would be, you know, if you if you lose power, that would be, that would make sense. Right. Does something, cr something crash the computer or shut it down abruptly? It wasn't a normal shutdown or Firefox wouldn't be complaining. But see, I was trying to, you know, I... I it sounded to me like it's more of a software problem than a hardware problem, which is one of the reasons why I didn't. Just well, I'll tell you why it might not be. A, a, it could be a hardware problem. So there's a couple of situations that could cause this a hardware issue. For instance, um, it's in sleep mode. Do you, have you ever noticed whether the fans ever come on in sleep mode? Because uh, it could be in sleep. Not it could be in sleep mode. Here's what. Here's the scenario. By the way, I'm just grasping at straws because there's many, <laughs> many things it could be, and I don't have any evidence that it's one over the other. But one of the things it could be uh, is that, in fact, it's heating up and it shuts down to protect itself. That would give you exactly that profile. And that would be a hardware issue, right? Uh, or the power supply glitches and poof, it just shuts down, hard shutdown. You open it up and it turns, you know, says, oh, I got to boot up. Okay. So it could be hardware. It probably is software. I agree with you. Um, well, I could take it back to the store and complain and then see what they say. <laughs> well, what they're, I'll tell you what they're going to tell you, and you probably should do this anyway, is they're going to say, okay, you know the system recovery partition? You know that the, the, the button that says re, re, redo it? Just I want you to erase the hard drive and start all over again. Okay. So that and that's you know they'll make you do that before they'll take it back. Okay. So because what they want to do is verify that it isn't a software issue, and that's the advantage of doing that. And you might want to do that if you know if you could just back up your data and just restore it, complete restore from scratch, and see if it comes back. And if it doesn't, then it was a software issue. If it does, then it's almost certainly a hardware issue. The other thing you can do, somebody's reminding me, is 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 use the event viewer to look at the event log. And see what the last entry in the log was after you put it to sleep. It could tell you what was running and if something crashed. You're going to have to do some sort of detective work like that because you don't have enough information right now to know what it is. Could be overheating, could be a power supply issue, could be a wild program crashing the whole system. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. If it is a program uh, crashing the system, though, it's going to be driver level. It has to be a ring zero capable program. So it would be more likely a driver going you know bonkers and crashing the system right and right. that would be that would be your your uh software error so right. another thing to do proactively if if that's the case by the way you might see some evidence of that in the event logs but more likely uh you wouldn't because it's not recording uh, anything it's not doing anything it's just the video driver has a memory leak and after a while it uses all the memory and crashes the whole thing so it'd be worth making sure you have all the latest drivers for all the hardware. Asus should have all of those. Update the firmware. Um, okay. Uh, and that might solve my other problem, which is I have Wi-Fi. It's on. It's working. And all of a sudden, my computer discon uh, disconnects from the Wi-Fi. I mean, it's, and I try and connect it, and it says it can't. Oh, yeah. This might be related. And so what I ended up having to do is either reboot the computer, yeah. I might turn it off, I mean, you know, turn close the lid and, and bring it back up. And I've tried, you know, I've turned off Wi-Fi, turned it back on, put it in airplane mode, turned it back on, disconnect it, reconnect it, and it just doesn't do it. And then I guess when I reboot it, then all of a sudden I can get, I get Wi-Fi again. So maybe it is... Uh, yeah, that that's well. not good. <laughs> um, <laughs> because I teach, because, you know, I'm teaching, I have everything set up, and then I go to class, and I'm ready to show something on YouTube or whatever, and all of a sudden, my Wi-Fi isn't working. <laughs> I, well, I would definitely look at the Wi-Fi drivers. Mm -hmm. They may be crashing. 
Uh, and they may be causing a, a full system crash. But I, it also may be... If, is it still under warranty? You said it was a year old? Yeah, I think it's a year old. If it's if it's still under warranty and you get a one year, this might be a really good time to bring it back. Okay. These are these sound these sound like they're this does sound like hardware, frankly. I mean it could be you can't tell. I don't have enough information to know. Right. Uh, but it could easily be a hardware issue which you wouldn't be able to fix. Right. Exactly. And in which case they'd have to give you a new computer. Did you buy it from a store? I got it from Best Buy. Oh, I think they have a pretty liberal return policy. I would just, I would just bring it back and get a new one. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I'll do that. Yeah, but do it before the, <laughs> the warranty runs out anymore. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> These all seem to fail right when the warranty runs out. Oh, absolutely. What do you, what do you teach? Uh, I teach at California State University, Northridge, uh, marketing and nice. management. Great. Two different departments. Fun. <laughs> Well, it's nice to meet you. Okay. I, I'm sorry I don't have anything more specific, but it's kind of these are these are the problems that are so hard to diagnose without. Oh, lots no, I, of, I understand. I mean, I messing. used to long time ago. I used to work for AT and T, and I used to uh, troubleshoot electronic. Oh well, you know, switching <laughs> systems over the telephone. Oh God, you know, <laughs> you know. Those are long calls. I know. Most exactly. of the time, you're on with them for hours. <laughs> exactly. Hey, thanks for the call. I appreciate it. Okay. Hope I hope we helped. All right, take care, Roger. Okay. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. Talked a little more with Roger about uh, things to, to look look at. And, you know, it's so hard to diagnose these things. Uh, he says, well, I'm sympathetic. He says, I worked for uh, AT&T for a while diagnosing uh, long distance via phone calls, uh, switching, electronic switching equipment, long calls. It reminds me, uh, earlier uh, this uh, week, I um, was setting up my daughter. has a new apartment. She's a college senior getting ready for life. And uh, helped her set up the Internet because, you know, dad's the tech guy. Can't make her do it herself. And uh, spent some fun time on the phone with Comcast. Always a pleasure. But I was I was really realizing the Comcast people were great. The, the, the tech, the CSRs, the customer service reps were very helpful. We had a modem. We were trying to get to work. Uh, but they have a, a, a challenging job. And I think this is not unusual. That uh, Comcast is a really good example of this. Because Comcast grew by accretion, you know, like a, like a barnacle. And by acquiring companies. And the problem is every company had its own system, and they kind of cobbled these together. They've grown so fast over such a short period of time that they, they weren't able to replace it with, or still haven't been able to replace it with one universal system. So they have all these incompatible systems talking to one another. The system the customer service rep uses is different from the one that the, the service tech at your house is using is different from the one that corporate uses. It's crazy. And I, it was a... I actually enjoyed the call. I spent uh, maybe an hour online with uh, Tier 2 customer support trying to get this thing work. And it, it really confirmed what I had thought and had heard from other customer service reps. She's looking and she said, well, this is wrong. These settings are wrong. I know they're wrong. I can't change them. They're grayed out. And, uh, you know, you're, <laughs> she said, well, I'm going to do this. I think this will make it work. Um but, you know, people, are, when you call in, the service rep is going to say, well, this you, 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 sh you can't be using this equipment. This Somebody else owns this equipment. And, it's, and just say, I know. <laughs> I've already been through this, and we figured it out. Don't mess with it. And I, you know, I, so I feel for you. So if you're working uh, as a customer service rep at Comcast or one of many companies where you've got these incompatible systems, maybe they're out of date. Maybe they just don't talk to each other. It's a big deal to, to, to go through a company the size of Comcast with as many customers as they have. They're the largest Internet service provider in the country and, and just rewrite everything from the ground up. It's what needs to happen, but it's like changing uh, you know, the engine of a jet airplane mid-flight. So I was, it was an interesting call, and I have some sympathy. And I think if you've ever done customer support, it's, you know, it can be challenging. Evangeline is on the line. Love that name. From Virginia Beach. Hi, Evangeline. Hi, Leo. How are you doing? Was, I'm a first-time caller and a long-time listener. Oh, nice to talk to you. Was your mom an Emmy Lou Harris fan? or? <laughs> no, no, she wasn't. I, I just it. wanted to say your your screener is awesome. She was very good at helping me frame my question. Isn't isn't Heather wonderful? I love Heather. She's yes. absolutely awesome. Oh, good. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I wanted to say I have a hand-me-down laptop, which I think is really awesome anyway. And it has an old administrator on there. And I, 
I well, I don't know anything about it. Yeah, but who I, is that old administrator, right? Where'd they come from? from? An old school. It's <laughs> from one of the old schools. And um, I just wanted to find out, is there any way that they could remotely come and no. wipe off? No, the they'd have to have physical or... apps access to your system. Uh, Unless... I know it, they were, like, linked all together. Ah, together well, time. okay, so that they gave to the different students. Yeah, unless they had software on there that allowed them to log in. And it sounds like they did. Ah. So, okay. so conceivably, generally my recommendation if you get a secondhand computer is to erase the drive and re and you know start fresh because otherwise you're inher inheriting what other problems they had. But the reason people often don't do that is well you don't have a Windows install disk lying around, do you? A what? A Windows what? <laughs> a Windows installer lying around, do you? What version of Windows no. is what version it's of Windows running, is it running? It's running eight point one. Okay, and when you did at any point did you get uh, did uh, Microsoft uh, pop up something saying would you like to upgrade to Windows ten? Mm, not that I know no. of. I okay. mean, um, it, it, yeah. it so wasn't this, made known to me. It was yeah. a gift because I'm going to school and my nice laptop is so outdated. Yeah, <laughs> it's a nice gift. In theory, if they had remote access software pre-installed on that computer, mm -hmm. it's conceivable. They'd have to know, though, things like your Internet address. It would be very hard for them to do that. On the other hand, they could sit down and log into your computer, and that would be another, you know, then they'd be able to log into that account. Did they? Do you have the password for that administrator account? I don't know that he does. My son was the one that gave it to me, and I know he will, because he, he was using it temporarily for a couple of months, and then he wound up getting a whole new laptop for himself. Well, one thing, one bad. thing it wouldn't be a bad idea yeah. to do Get the uh -huh. password, log into that account, look at what's installed on there, remove anything that says remote access or VPN or anything like that, and then change the administrator password so that only you know it. But okay, nobody... Now, it's, he has it where, where, he, where, like, when you open it up, he's given me my own passcode where I can yeah. log in that yeah, way. Yeah, he set so, you up. I don't know. So, okay, yeah, because I know he did a lot of stuff he said he he's, did, it's but he still wasn't sure if that was something they could do. Yeah, could be. You know, you can't ever say for sure because you don't know what they did to it. They could put, they could easily have put something called a rat on there, a remote access Trojan that allows them to log in and see everything you're doing, even turn on the camera. But it came from a nice people, right? It didn't come from some bad guy. Um, well, I don't know if there's, no, 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 it wasn't bad. It was the ones that got shut down not too long ago, <laughs> whom I won't mention, but I'm sure you're But they went familiar. out of business. They weren't. Yes. Yeah. They went out of, I think they, you're probably uh, all right. But any time, but this is really important to understand when, it, when you're inheriting somebody's computer, you don't know what's on there. And there is yeah, always. It was my sons. It was my sons. But I'm just. I, I'm not worried about. What oh, I see. I see. It, it. It was the fact that it was tied to his school, and the school I got see. shut down. Yeah, but the yeah. school probably had software on there to monitor what the kids were doing with the computer. Okay. Okay. And so they could still be active if somebody who worked there knew how to do it. Yeah, but the, but it's got shut down. So yeah, but that that person didn't die. They didn't. They're still around, right? I mean, just no, they're, they're working. They're, yeah, but they're working for somebody. The person who set it up is working for somebody else now. He he didn't he didn't move to he didn't he didn't move to you know Spain. I mean, he's still around, right? Whoever set that up. So that person may have a way to la access your computer. Yes, I don't know if you should worry about that or not. In general, what I would like, in general, what I would like you to do, and I would, I would recommend you ask your son to do, is okay. is to wipe that computer and reinstall the operating system. That's the safest thing to do. Oh, okay. I don't think there's a danger, but I can't tell you there's not because I don't, you know, just as you can't, we don't know what's on there. So the safest thing to do, and it's always the case when you get a used computer. 
is mm -hmm. is to is to wipe the drive and reinstall Windows. You have a Windows recovery partition on there, which you could use to do that with. Your son will probably know how to do that if he was a student there. Okay. All right. So and then okay. So reinstall. So is that done with a a disk or something? No, you have all the stuff you need on the computer. On the yeah. If you go to Windows, if you hit the <laughs> Windows key and type recovery. But your son will know how to do that. Now, make sure you back up anything you did and saved on that computer. Because what I want you to do is wipe the hard drive and reinstall it. It's the only way you can be sure that that thing is clean as a whistle. That's what, that's the way it should work. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Last segment of the show, and I like to go out with a bang. That's why every day, every week, we get this guy on, Dick D. Bartolo. Mad Magazine's maddest writer and our Gizmo Wizard, or Gizwiz for short. Hi, Dickie D. Leo, how you doing, pal? You got a gizmo for me? You know what, Leo? If we had these when we were kids, we would be happier than we are now. <laughs> well, then maybe not. No, well, maybe wait not. a minute. Don't no. tell me. Don't tell me. Um, Funyuns? I don't know what. No, no. Okay, so Toy Fair was in town this oh, week. Oh, Toy Fair. Man, I'm Toy so jealous. Toy Fair. Oh. So I go over and I see this uh, go-kart, electric go-kart. And I said, so what's the go-kart doing here? And she said, well, it's not just a go-kart. It's a smart go-kart with its own Wi-Fi system so that you can geofence where you want your kid to drive his smart oh. cart. Oh, where you can monitor his speed. You can see how fast he's driving. Ooh. And th this goes up to 12 miles an hour. Yikes. And if you don't like it, you can dial his speed back. And I said, well, what happens if he just drives right out of the geofence system? Does it just stop dead? And they said, well, no, For as a safety thing, but it just slows the cart way down, so he's going to be, <laughs> be very, <laughs> very unhappy about that. Uh, so since it has twin electric motors, it doesn't have the sounds of a, of a high-powered car. But through the GPS, you can play engine sounds uh, through the two speakers built into the seat. What? Okay. Vroom. And what, finally, you know what? when we were kids, we went vroom, vroom, and we were yeah, happy. Yeah, exactly. An uh, orange crate on vroom. a pair of skates. <laughs> <laughs> and if we went out of the geofenced area, it wouldn't slow down. But Your mom, mom would give say, us a, you're not getting any dessert. You get back here. You. Yeah. <laughs> so what's the name of this amazing uh, until, 21st uh, so century? It's from Active Motors, and it's the Arrow Smart Cart. It's $999. Ouch. Okay. Well, don't don't forget. Now it also has a collision avoidance system built in. <laughs> Get the kid used to self-driving cars now. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, and as a go kart, it's nine ninety nine. If you want to add the body, like a red or a silver body, it's two hundred dollars more. Oh, so there you wow. go. There, there's uh, now. Um, what ages would this be appropriate? This you know, it says cool. from ages five to nine. Okay, so it's pretty little. It's pretty little, yeah. exactly. And how does how and long does it go on a charge? That's you a, know what you can you can charge uh, forty five minutes on a battery that comes with it, an hour and a half if you want to buy the uh, double uh, energy. <laughs> a battery. go kart with Wi Fi and GPS. Yes. Wow. Yes, wow, and then wow, the kid wow. can also when he gets home uh, his. His uh, app will tell him how how far he drove, where he drove. It's pretty. It's pretty neat. Does it self park? Uh, no, not yet. Not yet. I like the geofence though. You could say you can't go out of the yard, and they really, they really can't. They really can't. Yeah. 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 And obviously, it's not for public roads, but uh, this is pretty cool. Lots. It's a little yeah, it's pricey, pretty cool. but boy, that's that's pretty yeah. Neat. It's yeah. it's pretty neat. Pretty yeah. neat. It's from Active A C T E V because it's an electro. E Volt com T thing car. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> EV. It. What does EV stand for? Electric. I have no electric ele vehicle. Maybe. Oh, that could be. Yeah, that's probably an electric vehicle. EV, and it's from ACTEV Motors. Dot com. The arrow. Com. I want one of these. You're right. I would have yeah, loved one of these. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm not showing exactly. my kid. It'd, he'd be pretty excited. But he's he's over nine, so I guess he couldn't fit in it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Probably not. Yeah. All right. We are getting him a Tesla anyway, right? They have little Teslas for kids, you know. They oh, do they? Yeah. <laughs> Tesla go-karts.
Oh my! They got to be more than a thousand bucks, though. I would think so. Yeah. But the really great thing is, he can just take the battery out of your car. <laughs> it's uh, from Radio Flyer, you know the wagon people. We've come. Yes. A we've come a long way. The Model oh. S for children, <laughs> ages three to eight. I don't know. It doesn't. Does it have the self-driving stuff? Probably not. But it does have an MP3 sound system and a a frunk, a front trunk. Uh, <laughs> working okay. headlights, working horn, spacious interior. Wow. wow. I wonder how much that costs. Drive around the playground and pick up the female toddlers. Yeah. Hey, baby, you want to go for a ride by <laughs> Tesla? If you want to see more about anything, Dick, oh, look, it even has a little plug-in charger that goes right where the Tesla's charger oh, that, goes. That is oh, so funny. Oh, my goodness. That is so great. Oh, my goodness. The radio flyer. That, they made they made those red wagons you and I played in. Yeah, uh, Dick is at gizwiz.biz. That's his website. So if you go to g i z w i z dot b i z, you can see the you know link to the active arrow and all the other great stuff Dick talks about. Not just in this show, but many other shows, including ABC's World News Now. You'll also find uh, a link to the What the Heck Is It contest for a chance to win an autographed copy of Mad Magazine. This is it, right? We got two yeah, more days. Yeah, a couple more days. Yeah, like. End of the month. Tuesday. And uh, you get, there's 12 autographed Mad Magazines for the right answer. You have to identify a close-up picture of a gadget. 24 for the cleverest wrong answer. So you do the math. And Dick. I can't. We <laughs> we will, uh, we'll of course, catch you every week on the Gizwiz podcast, gizwiz.tv. And yep. we'll catch you back here next week for another episode of the Perfect. Weekly Thank you, Dickie D. Okay, buddy. Take care. Bye. The Tesla's only five hundred fifty bucks. Wow. Wow. But but it doesn't have geofencing. Bill Fullerton, California. I think the last call of the day. Hi, Bill. Hey, Leo. Welcome. I've got a uh, Sony television. I remember when TVs used to just be a TV. Yep. <laughs> this is a smart TV. It's running Android, and, and I get error messages, and it tends oh. to freeze, and I have to literally unplug it oh. and reboot it. Oh. You know, this is why having computer technology everywhere is not a good idea. You don't – I had the other day, I had my oven had to reboot, and I had to erase – it It was running Android. I had to erase it and start over. <laughs> Your oven? My <laughs> oven! My, oh, my God. I, I had all – I had ready to cook dinner. I had the salmon all – prepped and on the and the the oven was re, it was in a boot loop so this is why uh i don't know uh computers what are you going to do that is not normal for android tv it's not normal for your sony uh i'm going to tell you something you probably already know there's something wrong with it okay. uh, uh it should not reboot ever uh it should it should uh be pretty solid um i've used i have an android tv device and android tv is pretty reliable but it's a computer and you know how computers get something's wrong um i i don't know if sony will have a method my oven did i called the uh, oven people and they said okay uh, unplug the oven press and hold the knob plug it in again count to 10 and the thing <laughs> rebooted <laughs> And it fixed itself. If Sony has a thing like that, that would be good. Otherwise, you might have to get them to come out and fix it, because that is not normal. Yeah, or a way to uh, plug it into your computer and see yeah. what's going on. Yeah, you know, it, it is running Android TV, so there is a way, I'm sure, to get to the bootloader, just as there is on any Android device, and uh, and and start over. But but they don't tell you what that is. It's a secret, super secret password protected you know, function. So they're going to, you're going to have to call Sony and say this. And they, and it's, it's not normal. Um, just because we make TVs with computers inside doesn't mean they should act like our PCs. Shouldn't be rebooting. I'm sorry that happened to you. Hey, thanks to all of you for joining. I'm joining us. You know, we got to all hang together because this is, this technology stuff, it never works right. That's what I'm here for. Have a great geek week. We'll see you next time. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy Show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, it's just the tip of the iceberg. We do nearly 30 shows on the Netcast Network. It's called 
TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week in Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security on Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on and on. You even get your daily dose of tech news with Tech News Today. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon, This Week in Tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.